Hello, good evening, Walter Muni. Hi. <laughs> yeah. And good uh, morning for everyone. Sorry, uh, Walter, your voice still mute. Yeah. I will send you. I will send you the lecture <laughs> from yesterday. Mm -hmm. so sorry. I want to say thing. Okay, can you hear me now, uh, Madonna? I hear you. Okay. Hello, oh, hello. Maybe my, my headset is broken. Yes. I hear you very, very well. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yes? Yeah, so I have the PowerPoint from yesterday. Uh -uh. So uh, after the fir first lecture starts, I can send you. I didn't send earlier. I was uh, at a meeting. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe uh, uh, so many participants uh, in this training, so uh, yeah, always, ask, always uh, asking for me. You know, there's yeah. about uh, presentation to, uh, yesterday. Yeah. Not, uh, never mind, never mind. Uh, well, to maybe uh, uh, today we have uh, two experts from the MKG, and uh, they will uh, deliver uh, the special uh, topic. Yeah, I think this a uh, topic related to in uh, uh, term of uh, this uh, training. So okay, uh, very good. Yes, and. We uh, we will uh, we will start uh, at eight o'clock until uh, we wait uh, moderator uh, for uh, today. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Miss Audia Kaluku, how are you? Yeah, oh, Miss Audio Koloku is one of a moderator today. <laughs> okay. Uh, she uh, she will uh, be guide.
Hey there. They uh, they would like to start with you. I was supposed to start at eight. And you were eight thirty. They want to start to get they had a crowded program. They just just advance as you have uh, thirty minutes. Okay. Bye. Well, sir, remain one minute. It's a possible. It is a possible uh, if we start, uh, but uh, if uh, a numbers of participant isn't a complete, because uh, yeah. yeah, I think it's it's yeah, because okay. Uh, Miss Audia Kaluku. Uh, yeah, Mrs. Madonna. Yeah, kita mulai aja. Should we start uh, now? Yeah. Aku mau, eh, aku coba mulai dulu ya. Oke, okay. ya, okay. yeah. ya. Yeah. I hope you, uh, you are ready uh, to start uh, the, uh, this uh, training. Ya, yeah, good morning for everyone in Indonesia and good evening for Water and Team. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Advanced F Hazard Earthquake and Tsunami Training Course. Maybe uh, in the second day of this training, it contains uh, some uh, topics. And today we have the special guest from BMKG. Uh, there are two topics that will be delivered by experts from BMKG. And uh, I, I want to give you the little information about the, the activity of this, uh, this event. Who will, who will be moderator today are Ms. Alia Kaluku from the Center for Engineering Seismology, Potential Geophysics, and Time, Time Warp. And the second one, Mr. Supriyadi from Center for Research and Development. Yeah, the first I invite Miss Audia Kaluku to be moderator at the first session before break. Yeah, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Mrs. Madonna. Hello, uh, good morning, everyone. Happy to see you today in uh, Advanced Earthquake and Tsunami Hazard Training Course, uh, Batch 2. Yeah, yeah uh, this is the training course, Batch 2. Before I introduce myself, my name is Audia Kaluku from Seismological Engineering Division uh, as the moderator in this first session today. Okay, uh, for this session, we have three speakers. We'll talk about uh, three different topics. They are Mr. Walter Muni will present about earthquake hazard. Mrs. Joan Chan will present about shallow seismic methods. And the last, Mr. Agustia Adimarta will present about ANT or ambient noise tomography. But before we start the presentation, I would like to inform you about the role of uh, this session. First, we have 30 minutes uh, time for each speaker to present about their topic. And after the first speaker finish the presentation, we'll continue with the second speaker and then the third speaker. Second, the discussion will open in the last session, but don't worry. If the participants have questions or opinion for the speaker, you can write it first in the Zoom chat, but don't forget to mention uh, the speaker you propose. For example, if you want asking to Mr. Walter, please give the note above to Walter followed by the questions. Or maybe you can also use raise hand feature to ask directly with the speaker. Okay, uh, participants, let we start with the first speaker, allow me to welcoming Mr. Walter Muni from United States Geological Survey. Hello, Mr. Walter. Are you ready for today? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Okay, you have uh, 30 minutes to explain about your topic. So please, time is yours. 
Mr. Walter. Thank you very much. And uh, we will make a small change in USGS training because uh, we want to explain fully the multi-channel array uh, seismic analysis. And uh, so we will give a bit more time to uh, Ms. Joanne Chan. Okay. Uh, Joanne is a very experienced expert on field acquisition, processing, and interpretation of shallow seismic data, which is important for engineering seismology and for earthquake hazards, because the shallow surface is where the buildings are located and where the strong shaking occurs. Uh, Joanne has studied many locations throughout California, and she, her presentations will feature a careful description of the methodology, the field acquisition, the data processing and interpretation. This will be followed by what we call case studies, some, some very specific examples of the results that USGS and the group she works in have obtained. We are very interested in learning about your experience as well. So during the discussion section, we hope that your experts on MASW will also uh, contribute some comparison. So uh, Joanne, please uh, share your screen and uh, the time is yours. All right, hello everybody. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening. All right, let me share my screen. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yes, very clearly. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Thank you for the introduction, Walter, and hello, everybody. Uh, today's talk, the first of my lecture, is the introduction of multi-channel analysis of surface waves, also known as MASW, um, which it is a seismic exploration technique that derives shear wave velocities from surface wave analysis. And I believe most of you are familiar with this method, but um, I will still do an introduction and hopefully I can provide something interesting, <laughs> something to discuss for everybody. So surface waves are generally responsible for damage associated with earthquakes. There are two kinds of surface waves, love waves and Rayleigh waves. Love waves move the ground from side to side, Really waves move the ground up and down and side to side. And it is often described as a retrograde elliptical motion. And most of the earthquake or most of the shaking felt from an earthquake is due to Rayleigh wave. And this is a very simple diagram of an active source seismic acquisition. And, and I want to make a note that we do primarily active source, uh, my group, does active source seismic acquisition. Um, so when we conduct a seismic acquisition using a compressional wave source, such as a sledgehammer, really waves usually manifest as a large amplitude, low frequency waves called a ground roll, which can mask reflections on the seismic record. So for a typical um, seismic reflection analysis, that is considered noise. This is just an example of a seismic record showing refracted, reflected, and surface waves. And you can see um, the surface wave kind of obstructing the reflected waves a little bit. But for our purposes, because we are using a surface wave method, that is not a, a large concern for us. Surface wave is often used in geotechnical site investigations to measure ground stiffness. Typically, shear wave is measured using different methods. One, uh, using surface wave analysis. Two, uh, downhole or crosshole survey. Three, laboratory measurements. Downhole, crosshole, and lab measurements usually require drilling or some sort of ground disturbance. Whereas surface wave survey generally is non-destructive 
and data quality has all is also uh, generally ha has higher signal to noise ratio. This figure shows a typical MASW data acquisition for a seismic site characterization using either a 24 or a 48 channel seismograph, um, low frequency geophones at four and a half hertz and sledgehammer. Um, in general, longer receiver spread and longer so source offset allow for deeper investigation depth. And this diagram shows um, usually use the same receiver spacing and various offset. And this is for a typical geotechnical site investigation. Investigations on soil stiffness in the upper 30 to 40 meters of the subsurface is part of what we do uh, in our group, but many of our studies include fault imaging in the upper hundreds of meters and sometimes up to several kilometers. So in addition to surface wave analysis, we also perform seismic refraction and reflection analysis. So the way we acquire our data is slightly different from a typical geotechnical site investigation. We generate a source at every receiver along with the spread. We also use a variable sources. We use sledgehammer, we use size gun, we use um, accelerated weight drop and explosives. And the sources that we use depend on the objective, um, the location and whether we have permission to use the sources. And similarly, our receiver spread ranges between 120 meters long to more than 25 kilometers. Again, it's all based on our, our, what our objectives are for our survey. The photo on the left is our technician using a weight drop um, for a fault imaging study in Hollywood. And the photo on the right is our geophysicist operating 260 channel seismographs for a site characterization study in Los Angeles a few years ago. There are three to four basic steps to the MASW method. The first is, of course, to acquire seismic data. And for us, uh, we, are, we use active source for our MASW analysis. Two is we construct a dispersion plot from the seismic record using a 2D wave field transformation method. And three, we evaluate and pick fundamental mode dispersion curves. So what is dispersion? When seismic velocity increases with depth, the longer wavelengths propagate faster than shorter wavelengths. So the frequency content of the wave disperses with travel time. A dispersion is plotted in frequency versus the propagation velocity, also known as phase velocity. And that is shown in the, as an example, the, this, the middle figure is a dispersion plot. And the dispersion curve with the slowest phase velocity is known as the fundamental mode. Um, and this is the, the dispersion curve that we use for inversion to obtain shear wave velocity. It is actually very common to see higher mode dispersion curves in the same plot, and they occur when more than one phase velocity exists for a given frequency. That means that higher modes have faster dispersion. And then the final step um, is to the inversion of fundamental mode dispersion curves to derive 1D shear wave velocity profile. And finally, we get 2D shear wave velocity model from a combination of multiple 1D shear wave velocity profiles. And to do this analysis, we use a commercially available software called Size Imager uh, for the MASW analysis. This is an example of a dispersion curve from a 2016 NAPA site characterization study that we did. Um, we can see the high amplitude fundamental mode is quite clear, but we can also see the lower amplitude higher modes um, appearing on the dispersion plot. We use automatic picking for the dispersion curves, but we also go back and evaluate, kind of examine all the auto picks so that we know we, we could be sure that they are, that the best, um, that the picks are reasonable. So shear wave velocity provides measurement of ground stiffness and prior studies suggest the upper 30 meters of the subsurface plays a major role in ground amplification. 
Also, downhole and other subsurface exploration methods, such as um, cone penetrating test, CPT, typically reaches 30 meters depth. So the time averaged uh, shear wave velocity in the top 30 meters uh, is known as VS30. It is used in building design and in ground motion prediction. In general, a lower VS30 will have greater ground um, amplification and potentially experience more damage from an earthquake. And this, um, this is just a very simple... Um, sorry? <laughs> okay, this is a very uh, simple diagram of just a two-layer model showing, um, showing you how to calculate VS30. The National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program, also known as NEHRB, classifies a site into one of several different categories based on VS30 values. So this table is the NEHRB VS30 site classification. The International Building Code uses the same VS30 site classification as one of the parameters for structural design. So VS30 is frequently used to evaluate soil properties and to account for site amplification in ground motion models and in ground motion prediction equations. This map of California is based on, um, is VS30 that's based on surface geology. And this information is used to create this map, um, which is um, a, a map of California that shows the relative intensity of ground shaking from anticipated future earthquakes. So this map was created using three criteria. One is historical historic earthquakes, two is slip rates on major faults and deformation in the region, and three is the potential for amplification of seismic waves by near surface geologic materials. So it's important that we provide site specific VS30 that may be missing from hazard maps, such as this using um, VS30 based on just the surface geology. Okay, the next few slides show damages in the Marina District in San Francisco from the 1989 magnitude 6.9 earthquake. The epicenter was um, in the Santa Cruz Mountains, approximately 96 kilometers south, south of San Francisco. The Marina, Marina District was built on top of artificial fill, sand, and uh, construction debris. And the neighborhood experienced stronger shaking than surrounding neighborhoods um, that were on top of bedrock or on firmer soils. Uh, many buildings in San Francisco are made of wood. Um, and so you can see on a photo on the left side, um, there's a whole apartment building that was burnt down um, because the ga gas line was damaged during the earthquake. Okay, a lot of buildings in San Francisco are called soft story buildings, which means that the ground floor is unreinforced and they're often garages. So um, the photo on the right shows um, basically a building that's tilted, that's sheared um, from, the, from the ground surface because there are um, unreinforced garages. It's just a door basically holding up this um, one side of the building. And then the photo on the left, um, the whole ground floor has flattened because those are all garages, which is just a door holding up the building essentially. So the city across the bay from San Francisco is Oakland, which also experienced damages from the earthquake. Uh, the photo on the left is the, the, the upper deck of the freeway, and it collapsed during the earthquake because of ground shaking and structural flaws. The freeway was built on top of fill and mud, and bay mud, and the uh, upper portion of the freeway was not adequately reinforced to the bottom part of the freeway. The picture on the right shows the upper part of the Bay Bridge. Uh, the Bay Bridge connects San Francisco and Oakland. Um, it collapsed because the bridge shifted 18 centimeters to the east and it sheared off the bolts holding the top portion of the bridge. So this series of photos is just to demonstrate the effect of the amplification of soft soils during an earthquake. Back to MESW. Um, 1D 
Shear wave velocity profiles help us interpret the underlying geologic materials and their potential for a strong ground shaking during an earthquake. Um, this is an example showing soft soils. And I would say VS3 will place this location uh, in the Herb site class E. We did a site characterization study in Southern California. Um, and we, where we acquired active source seismic data next to an electrical substation, which has a strong motion recording station on its property. So our results show um, has a, we made a 2D VS model showing low velocity structures um, at the Eastern end of the profile, which correlates with the location of a natural drainage that we were able to observe from aerial photographs. Um, the strong motion station is actually on the western end of the profile. So you can see that the, the western end of the profile has slightly higher velo shear wave velocity versus the eastern end of the profile. And we did, um, we kind of calculated VS30 approximately at every two meters along the profile because that's, that was our receiver spacing. And we found that the maximum and the minimum shear wave velocity varies by a, almost by 100 meters per second. So this just demonstrates the lateral variability of a lot of the um, sites that we um, investigate. So the advantages, some of the advantages and disadvantages of uh, MASW, the, that the main advantages would be that it's relatively not invasive, especially for geotechnical purposes. Um, it can be quite fast, especially again for geotechnical site, per, site <laughs> geotechnical site investigations because you're only um, um, doing a source at the off end. Uh, whereas we do things a little bit differently because we want to get as much use out of the data set as we can. Um, and also provides a high resolution in the upper 30 meters of the subsurface. Some of the disadvantages would be that it is best for horizontal layers, uh, geological layers without much lateral variability. And we, because we also acquire S-wave data, so we can compare it to S-wave refraction tomography. And we find that MA, the shear wave velocity from MASW tend to be a little bit lower than S-wave refraction tomography. And that is actually it for my methods. Yeah, so we can do the uh, Northern California case study. Yeah. Let me stop this and share that. Okay. And you can give more detail. Oh, you have 43. So you can take your time because you have uh, extra nine minutes. Yeah, okay. So um, we do a lot of fault, fault investigation. So it's not most of our, I would say most of our work is fault imaging and seismic hazard. So it's not strictly site characterization. So this is a first of two case studies that I would like to talk about today. The city of Napa is located approximately 60 kilometers northeast of San Francisco. And you can see in the yellow box. In 2014, there was a magnitude 6.0 earthquake um, that was located approximately 13 kilometers southwest of the city of Napa, uh, where the earthquake cost an estimated 400 to 800 million in damage to residential and commercial properties. And this is the USGS shake map showing ground motion and shaking intensity following the Napa earthquake. And shaking was felt as far as way, as far away as Nevada. So this is um, a lighter, lighter image of a post-earthquake mapping. Field observations and geodetic mapping identified approximately 12 to 13 kilometers of surface rupture and more than 30 kilometers of surface deformation 
distributed along six subparallel fault strands of the West Napa fault zone. There, we also identify 46 long, uh, centimeters of right lateral uh, displacement and 15 centimeter of vertical displacement. And this is a photograph taken by one of our scientists at a winery in Napa showing the vertical displacement. This is a one of the um, a neighborhood in the city of Napa showing surface rupture. And you can see in the, at the building in the back, that's actually, you can see garages. And the reason why it's not damaged is because there's no building above it. And so the difference between the, the photo that I showed you in the Marina District in San Francisco is they have um, living quarters above the, the garages. That's why, and it's the extra load that um, damaged the buildings. Whereas for this, this is just, there's nothing on top of the garage. So um, there is no significant can damage that I could see to the to the building here. Okay. This is a um, a storage facility at a winery, and I would say this building is probably not reinforced. And so this is actually typical for certain neighborhoods in Napa, uh, unreinforced masonry where you have just bricks falling, um, all falling off the building, chimneys falling off of houses, which was actually quite common. <clears throat> and then of course there's an unreinforced, um, the photo on the right is unreinforced soft story building where the first level is um, parking and um, living quarters above it. So prior gravity data study um, suggests that the deep sedimentary basin underlying Napa Valley, and this is um, a plot, a map of the thickness of Cenozoic sedimentary deposits derived from gravity data inversion. And, and you can see, can you see, well, probably can't see my cursor, but N is uh, the city of Napa. And it looks, it suggests that there's up to four kilometers um, of sediment underlying Napa Valley. City of Napa building inspectors evaluated damages to the buildings after the earthquake. And now buildings that were severely damaged received the red tag, which means that you cannot enter the building because it is unsafe. Moderately damaged buildings received the yellow tag, which means you can enter the building, but un only under certain conditions. Um, a study by USGS scientists found that distribution of damaged structures suggests that the damage strongly correlated with buildings that are older than that were built before 1950 um, and with a sedimentary basin depth. And this is um, a map of um, the location of the red and yellow tag buildings and also the ISO contours of basin depth based on gravity data. Okay, this is a compilation of the early studies from the Napa earthquake, surface ruptures um, or new surface ruptures from the earthquake. They're the red lines, aftershocks, um, damaged buildings, again, are the red and yellow tacked buildings. Also seismic stations are the triangles. Um, I believe the white triangles are permanent stations and the black triangles are the, um, aftershock deployments. And of course, there's also surface geology superimposed over the, the, air, the region. So the goal of this study was to evaluate the basin-wide shear wave velocities, um, to evaluate basin depth, and also to correlate the damage from the 2014 earthquake to shear wave velocities.
So we conducted, conducted an active source seismic investigation across Napa Valley in 2016 with two basin-wide seismic profiles up to 20 kilometers long. Um, both seismic profiles intersected in downtown Napa where numerous buildings were damaged during the earthquake. Um, and I will only present results from the east-west profile because it, that, that's actually more interesting than the northwest. In the in the first lecture, I said that um, I meant the MASW is non-invasive. Well, the this this particular survey was pretty invasive. We drilled 20, uh, 34 shot holes for explosives, and so they were spaced approximately one kilometers apart along each of the profiles. And we had two drill teams. Um, we took multiple days to drill because most shot holes um, took a full day, and these. Two photos are to highlight just the wetness of the of the soil. Um, most of the, depending on location, the shot holes were anywhere from four to twelve meters deep. And this, uh, and we drilled in October, so this was late late summer and also in a drought year. But it, the ground was still quite wet. We had more than 25 volunteers, interns, and scientists deploy 666 two-component seismographs across the Napa Valley. Um, these are the, the Texans, the RT-125 Texans uh, from IRIS. And I want to actually mention that two years ago, 2019, we started purchasing our own um, NOTO seismographs. So we no longer use the Texans. And we have, I believe, up to 500 in our pool that we can use um, for any large scale experiment. Should I stop here and do the results for the next session? Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Can you continue? Okay. Okay. So this is the P-wave seismic refraction tomography model showing the upper four kilometers of the subsurface. Um, and you can see that the West Napa Fault Zone is um, highlighted near meter 5,000. And that there's, um, we can see the basin in sort of in the middle of the, of the model. And also there's a higher velocity to the northeast end of the profile at depth. Of course, because it, we also collected S-wave data, so we have S-wave refraction tomography showing the upper four kilometers of the subsurface. And we can see a basin, and the shear wave velocity suggests that the basalt is around 1.5 kilometers depth. And because we have P wave and S wave um, results, we may, we did a VPVS ratio model, which from prior studies, um, high VPVS ratios usually suggest the presence of the fault. So we can see the West Napa fault zone and the basin nicely highlighted. And also there is an anomaly to the Northeast end of the profile. Um, at approximately meter 1.5 or 15 kilometers. And we also made a Poisson's ratio models. Prior studies also suggest that uh, Poisson's ratios above, at or above 0.44 suggest saturated fault zones. And again, we can see that area um, in the, near the West, West Napa fault zone at the Napa, um, Napa Valley in downtown Napa, and also that anomaly to the um, eastern northeastern end of the profile at meter 15 kilometers. And finally, we these are the two MASW models. It, it's the east-west profile. So we used both because we collected both P wave and S wave. So I use we used um, Rayleigh and Love waves. 
the top model is using MASW using Rayleigh waves and the bottom is MASW using love waves. And even though the, the velocity is slightly off, um, they show very similar velocity structures at depth where you can see uh, the location of the Napa Valley Basin, the anomaly near the northeast end of the profile near 14 to 15 kilometers, and also the West Napa Volson, which is around five to 6,000 um, at distance meter, five to 6,000. And um, I have the topography across the valley on top above the model. And we can see that shear wave velocity correlates with topography where locations of greater relief, so in the western and eastern section of the profile, exhibit higher velocities. And locations with little to no relief exhibit the lowest velocity, shear wave velocities. Um, and I want to mention that at the western and eastern end of the profile, we could see um, basalt actually um, on the surface, on the ground surface. Okay, and this is just a, a plot of VS30 calculated from the Rayleigh and Love Wave data set of the East-West profile. And um, I believe I plotted it at every 100 meters along the profile, or even 200. I think it was more like 200 meters along the profile, just to show the VS30 and um, kind of where it falls within the NEHRP site class. So it looks like the VS30 primarily falls within site classes B, C, and D, um, except VS30 near the Napa River is within the upper limits of site class B. And also you can see, um, the red column is approximately where most um, the red tech buildings are located. And then the yellow column is where most of the yellow tech buildings are located. So you can see that VS30 tend to be lowest uh, where, um, red, where there are a concentration of red tech buildings in the city of Napa. Oh, and also one more thing I want to point out is that um, where there are mapped fault locations like Carneros Fault near meter distance meter 2000 uh, West Napa Fault Zone between distance meter 4,500 to about 7,000 and also um, Soda Creek Fault, you can see VS30, there is a distinct low in those areas. And that anomaly at the Northeast and of the profile near distance meter 15 kilometers, it's also a distinct low, but it's, we, there is not a mapped uh, fault as far as we know. So that is possibly an area of investigation in the future. The conclusion with for this um, study is that low shear wave velocity correlates with known faults. And of course, with damaged buildings, especially with uh, red tagged buildings in the city of Napa. And from our MASW study, basin depth um, appears to be much shallower. Um, we, we interpret it to be about 300 to 400 meter deep. And our VS30 site classes C, D, and E correlate with observed damaged areas in Napa. So our surface wave analysis using MASW method provides the details and variations that may be missing from hazard maps using VS30 based on surface geology. So our local and regional work can help improve the accuracy of regional seismic hazard maps in California. And this actually concludes my, my first case study. The rest would be my second case study. I don't know if you want me to continue or... Um... No, I think, uh, Audia, could we have some discussion of MASW yeah. because we have the time. Okay, uh, uh, sure, sure. You you have more time, Mrs. Joan and Mr. Walter. Maybe if you want to continue your presentation, uh, yes. please um, go ahead. Joan, could, 
Could you clarify uh, the correlation of uh, via low VS30 with the red tag buildings by showing us the red tag building uh, slide, the, the map, the map. The map, yes. Okay, maybe, uh, maybe. Uh, okay. In, we, we can continue, we can continue in discussion session. Or uh, we go to the next speaker before. Okay. Well, Walter? Yeah. Well, next speaker uh, can be uh, in um, 15 minutes and we can have 15, we change the schedule. Uh, short discussion and then the next speaker can be uh, at um, uh, nine o'clock. Okay, uh, so we continue with the discussion session, I think, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, before I, before okay, we forget. Okay. <laughs> I will open okay. the discussion. For all participants, maybe, uh, is there any question or anyone here to want to discuss about this method with the Mr. Walter and Mrs. John? Please, maybe you you can uh, raise your hands or uh, give interrupt and mention your name, Walter, for information. Uh, related to MASW survey activities, uh, engineering seismology division has also conducted uh, this survey in several locations in Indonesia with priority cities such as Semarang, Serang, uh, Medan, and several other cities. And uh, some of training participants uh, who have been involved in these activities maybe could tell more about their experience and discussions about this method. Uh, so this, anyone here to discussion about this method? Maybe uh, there, there are Mr. Edi Santoso and then uh, Devinta Tresnareza or Fani Habiba. Uh, Okay, Walter, please. Excuse me, Mbak Oti. Yeah, Pak. Yeah, I okay. have one. I have one question. Okay, uh, please, Mr. Suprianto, maybe you yeah. have a question or discussion about uh, MASW. Uh, okay, thank you. I just uh, want to ask: How do you conduct testing or verification of the result? Do you use other data for verification? That's my question. How do you conduct testing or verification of the result? Oh, okay. So the question is how to other data? the verification yeah, of the results. Yeah. Most of our, um, yeah, most of our, when we acquire our seismic data, we, we acquire it in such a way that we can also do S-way tomography, refraction tomography. So we always, so MASW is just one method out of several methods that we use when we investigate a site. Um, so a lot of times we, we always compare it to our S-way refraction tomography. And finally, to um, once we get the velocity um, results, we do a reflection analysis. So um, for most of our studies, we have MASW, we have P-wave refraction tomography, we have S-wave refraction tomography, and we also have um, reflection um, results. And when there are well data, or we'll compare our results to, the, to any available well data as well. Do you not compare with the catalog, for example, the density? Sorry, the question is to compare it to the catalog? No, catalog, catalog, density versus the depth. 
Audia, we cannot quite catch what we should compare with. Can you repeat uh, Audia what he wants to compare with? Kata par gitu, Audi. Ya. Apakah mereka membandingkan dengan data par ini? Uh, so we can, uh, I think uh, we can not compare with the data board because uh, there are no uh, complete hmm. data board in some regions. I think uh, maybe. Hmm. Someone can help me to explain about uh, our activity in uh, seismological engineering. Uh, there are some participants from seismological engineering, Walter, maybe, uh, uh, and then they could more sharing and discussion uh, with us. Yes, um, uh, Joanne, uh, there's mm -hmm. some question for you in the chat in the chat room. Let me see. Yeah, Joanne, uh, this is, uh, there are questions for you uh, from Sandy. Joanne. Okay, it looks like Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, do how do you we see it? How do we relate the results of the MASW analysis to the possibility of liquefaction in an observed area? Are there certain characteristics that indicate the possibility of liquefaction? As far as I know, um, site, NIHRB site classes um, is used to interpret the, the soil um, and kind of to describe the soil condition. So anything that's, I would say site class E, let me go back to that slide. So site class E, um, soft clay soil usually means that it is saturated. Um, and I right. don't know what the, so I would have to look at the Marina district. I'm, I think somebody did, yeah, they did do a, they did CPT uh, in the Marina district. So they, they are able to tell kind of where liquefaction happened and the approximate VS30 that's measured. Can area. you show that? Can you show that slide with the maybe it's from the other talk previous the method uh, where you show the saturation depth? Or don't have that slide. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, so you're saying that um, the MASW can identify where you're in the saturated zone because the velocity uh, the, will increase for the Rayleigh wave. And um, that would be that would indicate uh, higher liquefaction hazard. Is that correct? How do you know when you're in the saturated zone? What with that MASW? Just just using MASW, I would have to actually just do um, a VS thirty and compare it to the site classification table. Okay. Okay. Um, um, there's another more questions for you in the chat room. Yeah, uh, for Joanne. Uh, Joanne, can you put your question. video on or you don't want to? Um, I'll put my video on. I just don't want to um, <laughs> to use too much bandwidth in case I crash. Uh, Joanne, next question for you. Okay. Uh, right. Can you then... explain the MASW method used and its equipment? What we know so far, RSW distance is not that far. And not, and not that deep. Yeah, um, I think for one of my previous slides, um, for geotypical, I would say ge typical geotechnical invest site investigations, your 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 profile spread is under a hundred meters. Um, I've seen eighty meter spread, but because we do a lot of um, fault investigation as well, so our we use. A lot of receivers, and we also um, our spread is much longer than a typical geotechnical uh, site investigation. So that's why we are able to image using MASW image um, much deeper than thirty meters. But um, I think for all of our site characterization work in Southern California, the shortest spread we use um, would be a hundred a hundred and twenty meters. But we try to actually go longer than that. 
So I have a question uh, then, mm -hmm. Audia. Why does uh, Ramat, Ramat, why does he say that the MASW distance is not that far and not that deep? It's only a matter of the data acquisition. It can be any, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, Walter. Uh, do you repeat your question? Um, the Ramat says the MASW is usually for short distance and giving not very deep result. Why? Why? Why in Indonesia do you only have short distance, and it, if you have long, long seismic array, longer mm -hmm. array, your result will be be deeper. Deeper, yeah. There's um, no limit. There is no limit. Excuse me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, maybe please, Pak Suprianto, help me yeah. to explain about. Because uh, we have and the instrument for MSW. But the problem is the source and also the length of the cable. Yeah. Uh, if the source, exactly. Yeah. If we use my pin the explosion, uh, so we can have the uh, strong source, maybe the design can uh, long and we can penetrate more deeper. Yeah. But very uh, good. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know uh, the instrument that you have. So hold Joanne, can you explain? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hold on the capital and also what kind of the source that you uh, use. Yeah, um, we we use a cable system. So traditionally, we use two 60 channel seismographs. So we have stratovisors that are 60 channels each. So if we use two at two meter spacing, that's, that's 120. Yeah, 220, 240. Source, source we use sledgehammer, um, accelerated weight drop. Oh, okay. um, sometimes we use a size gun. So it really, it depends on our objective and it depends on how deep we want to investigate, uh, what we're investigating and the location. Um, so for large projects like the Napa, project that I just described, we used explosive sources. And that was, um, our profile was 200 or 25 kilometers long, 20 to 25 kilometers long. So that objective, our objective was actually to try to image the basin, um, but we just used, um, because we have the data and we have the capability. So we used MASW to analyze that same data set in addition to refraction tomography and reflection. Yeah, I think makes sense. So maybe BMKG can buy a uh, longer cable, like uh, yeah. longer, so get deeper, deeper result, mm -hmm. more valuable result. Yeah. I think there's more questions for you in chat, chat room. Yeah, in, in chat room, uh, another question. Uh, Joan, with the result from the uh -huh. MASW measurement, can we use the data to make a special plan to build an seismic building? And how do you apply that? A seismic building? Yeah. Can you? Um... A seismic <laughs> building. Uh, a, mit a building based on mitigation hazard. Okay. A strong building, uh, res yeah. earthquake resistant, Completely earthquake resistant building. building. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and I would say that is um, using MASW, you calculate VS30 and like, oh, I guess you guys can't see, oops. <laughs> um, I have to share a different screen with you guys. Okay, now you can see this, the site classification table. So like I mentioned, this is the, the international building code uses this, table to uh, for the building design. So based on a VS30 of a site, they know it's, you know, if it's a soft clay soil, like a site class E, they know um, that's factored into their building plan. So it's, um, and that's using the MASW and calculating VS30. Can you look at the question, uh, Joanne, it says, to get a good VS profile, et cetera. Is that the next question? 
Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. So the question is to get a good VS profile results from the MASW method, whether the measurement uses Rayleigh and Love waves or just one type of wave. And this is also related to the type of geophone, whether it is enough with a vertical geophone or a horizontal geophone or both. And what do you think about VS30 profile of HBSR curve inversion? That's three questions. That is, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, so the, the first question, question is, yeah. Rayleigh versus love wave, or do you need both? Yeah. Um, from, it's, I would say, used for the MASW method, it's very site dependent. Um, I find that Rayleigh and love wave, the results are very, very, very similar. If the geologic material is very, is horizontal and there's very little, lateral variation. So, so no topography, it's flat. Um, it's not geologically complex. Then I would say Rayleigh and Love Waves, they're very similar. And because most people, it's easier to obtain Rayleigh Wave because you, you don't have to collect S Wave to, um, to look at the Love Waves. So. What about the type of geophone? Uh, this is your phone. All of our, well, we always collect both P and S wave data. Um, and usually when we have um, a seismograph, it's two or three components. So we always, we always have the vertical and horizontal data. We do both. Um, but you wait a minute. Wait a minute. You you said that the Rayleigh wave results are quite reliable. So if you had to, you could get away would, with only. I vertical. could get with just vertical with Rayleigh because it's yeah. it is reliable yeah. and it's easier. It's basically if you just have one type of phone vertical, then it's reliable. I would say okay. just use Thank you. vertical Thank Rayleigh you. wave. And also, I think the so the wave is the. The crown roll, crown roll is the relic wave, right? Mm -hmm. We not use the love wave, but we use the crown roll from the hammer or wake drop, so can uh, can create the uh, relic wave or crown roll. Uh, we are not use the love wave. Okay. They don't have good love wave signals, Joanne. Yeah. But they have very good Rayleigh wave on the vertical component. So that's what they're. That's what they use. Right, nice, Walter. Yeah, I would so say from my experience, it's sometimes Rayleigh wave is clear on a um, dispersion plot than love waves. And do you have experience with H over V spectral Actually, ratio? Actually, I I have no experience with with HBSR, so I oh, just just skip that. that. Go to the, the next one is they want to know how, it's not clear how you get a two-dimensional. Two-dimensional MASW. Can you explain it again? Okay, so we, it's through interpolating a series of 1D shear wave velocity profile. Right. Does that, does that answer? Maybe ex expand on that answer, expand a little bit. Okay, um, I can, you know, it's probably easiest if I can just show you. Um, a, um, just show this to you. Okay, um, so it's a series of 1D sure wave philosophy profile. So if we are, um, so say every, every two meters along the profile, we obtain a 1D shear wave velocity profile. And through that interpolation, we obtain a 2D uh, velocity model. So this is a series of, you can imagine a series of 1D uh, profile. Is that? Answer. Okay, uh, John. Uh, there is a uh, next question for you, John. Is it possible mm -hmm. if 
it's only 12 channel geopon forget the data in small area could just, you explain wait just 12 channel is it possible if is it possible if we just use only uh, 12 channel 12 channel geopon forget uh, the data to get, in to get, uh, to get the data in a small area to get um if 12 geophones, you know, if you can space them out, <laughs> you can space out the geophone. Um, yeah. So you want to, if you, so to get a minimum of, this is just a rule of thumb, a general rule of thumb, to get a minimum of 30 meters, so with three times of that, so you want at least 90 meters, so you can space out the 12 geophones to 90 meters spread. Okay. So your answer, your answer is that uh, 12 geophones might be enough, but they have to be spread out over spread 90 out. meters. Yeah. So to the get, cable. To get that. The cable. Oh, right. Yeah. It depends on the cable, too. That's right. I was thinking about standalone um, nodes. But yeah, it's, I guess it's, it's a lot of it. It's instrument dependent. Depends on what instruments you have. If it's cable, I think most of the, the geophone spread, the, it's five meters, I believe. Uh, but if you want, another, yeah. Another question for you. Uh, I heard your explanation. Um, I heard your explanation earlier. Why VS30 is the time average velocity of the shear wave at a depth of 30 meters, but not the mean velocity at the shear waves at 30. Um, the reason is because um, the, the upper layers have more, it's calculated in a way so that the the shallower layer has more um, weight to the to the shear wave velocity results, and that's why it's time averaged instead of the mean mean velocity of the top thirty meters. I agree. That, yeah, you're right. Does that make sense? That, yeah, that's that makes good sense. Okay. Uh... Any more questions? Questions so, or, according sorry. to according to the questions I hear, the uh, limitation presently at BMKG is you don't have um, flexible cable system. Maybe you have only limited length, limited length, and limited number of geophone. It would be better if you have uh, several cables, different cables, for longer distance and um, uh, longer distance and uh, maybe some strong source, energetic yeah. source like uh, weight, weight drop, drop. Yeah. weight drop for, for strong yeah. energy. Otherwise you can only do very short profiles for very shallow structure, shallow velocity. Uh, Walter, I have one question. Actually, yeah. how reliable is the VS30 from USGS? We can uh, get the VS30 from USGS, USGS website. How reliable the, uh, the uh, VS30 from uh, USGS uh, website? Yeah, that VS30 is approximated by the topography. So if the, if the ground surface is very steep, it means the rock is very strong and the VS30 is high. If the, if the ground surface is very level, uh, the uh, assumption is VS30 is much lower, but it's not it's only, uh, only an estimate, only a guess. So my question for Joanne is, mm -hmm. what's the agreement between the VS30 on the USGS website or by topographic estimation compared to your field measurement? Is there agreement or can it vary by a factor of two or something? I would say for the flat, for the um, flatter, you know, 
quaternary alluvium. They're, the geologic interpretation is quite close to measured, but where there is a very wider variation is when there are more topography, when there's an assumption that it's a hard rock on the surface. Okay, so for the for the flat surfaces, the VS30 estimate from USGS is not too bad, but as you start to tilt more, when there's the, more the disagreement becomes larger. To, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. if it's possible to take the VS30 from from the USGS website. Why do you need to measure it? Well, very well. It's because when we do just a short profile like this, it's 160 meter long. There is a, a, almost 100 meters per second variation just across this short length of profile. So. So there's lots of we just, variation, yeah. lateral there's, variation. There's variations, even though the site looks flat, um, there's still, you know, pretty significant variation. And uh, I mean, it looks flat on map because it's been paved over um, to build an electric substation. So if if BMKG were going to, to purchase uh, a new cable, what do you recommend? Uh, 60 channels with two meter spacing to do, v, to do VS30? Or, or do you recommend the, 200 meter cable the, with? What's the exis existing um, instruments that BMKG is using? Is it like a 24 channel geode or a 12 channel geode? Oh, we have a 24 channel geophone. Uh, okay. Joan. Another with the uh, uh, space uh, between the geophone is two meter. For um, 48 channels would give you um, a two meter spacing or even three meter spacing will give you um, 30 meters of investigation depth, but also it depends on the location as well. Right, right. It depends on the velocity structure. Mm -hmm. So I think maybe USGS should give uh, BMKG a 48 channel system or 60 channel system to for the cooperation. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'll ask my boss. <laughs> I'll ask my superior. Uh, Joan, uh, mm -hmm. there is still one question for you. Maybe you can see in the from Market Sofian. Uh, I think mm -hmm. there are many methods to determining VS30 identification of subsurface or faults, like the spatial autocorrelation or SPAC, standard penetration test, resistivity tomography and gravity methods. My question is, what are the advantage and disadvantage of the MASW method compared to the method I mentioned earlier? Compared to other methods like spatial autocorrelation? I am not familiar with the other methods. Um, I guess standard penetration test, is that CPT? Yeah, right. Okay. CPT, it's, you're, I mean, I guess, because most of what we do, we ultimately we want to obtain a 2D um, result. So if we, let's just, for example, using CPT, if we want to do, obtain a 2D result, that means we have to punch a lot of holes. So it's, it's really, it's product um, dependent for us anyway. 
Um, but as far as the other methods, I am not familiar with them. Walter, are you familiar? Well, uh, with the let me. Yeah, I'm. I'm familiar with all of them. But uh, let me ask you. You gave us a lecture on Napa, mm -hmm. and in the beginning, you showed the gravity result mm -hmm. and the gravity interpretation. Mm -hmm. So my question is. Do the, do the seismic and the gravity agree or, or should the gravity be reinterpreted now using the new seismic information? Yeah, our seismic results, um, and that's in addition to MASW, so I'm including um, the refraction tomographies right. indicate that the basin is shallower than what the gravity indicates. Um, and I believe, um, that has ha happened in for other work in different areas as well, and in the bay, other parts of the Bay Area, where um, seismic results show a shallower, um, say, depth to bedrock than what gravity would indicate. So the the answer to the question from uh, Market Sofian mm -hmm. is that the gravity method by itself is non unique, uh, cannot, give, cannot give the final answer. It's necessary to combine with the seismic so that we can estimate the density, the proper density uh, below the surface and then combine gravity and seismic together. So Even with our seismic results, we use several methods to compare. So we're not just relying on one method, you know, not just relying on MASW, we, we compare it to refraction and reflection as well. And any uh, existing geology, geologic information. Right. Excuse me, but what, uh, maybe I will combine the SPAC and the MASW. And the different, the first is the, the source, the SPAC is in the Passive, passive source, but in the upper, in the uh, SW is the active source. Uh, for the uh, MASW, we more is said to get the dispersion curve, uh, but it is a more difficult in the spark or autocorrection. Uh, that's the advantage, the advantage of the. Uh, MIS W method, I think, from Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think more sharp rather than the spark. Yeah. But spark uh, can penetrate more deeper than uh, MISW. Thank you. So for the for the geotechnical and engineering seismology, uh, USGS keeps pushing forward to get uh, longer cables, better sources, two component recording, MASW together with refraction tomography yeah. and ambient noise. So you cannot sit still. You cannot just use the old, old equipment and old technique. You, it's better if you always take the next step, next step forward. Of course, you need some money. You need money for equipment. <laughs> you can borrow too. Or you can borrow, borrow equipment. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, sorry for Mr. Walter and Mr. Yuan, but I think uh, this the time for this session is over. Uh, can we go to the uh, next speaker or should we continue our discussion? I think the time is uh, is now for the next speaker uh, because it's nine twelve, and the, according to the program, uh, next speaker should be now. So this is a very good time to have uh, ambient noise tomography lecture. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thank, thank you. you.
thank, thank you, Walter, and thank you, uh, Joan, for your presentation and for your great explanation about uh, MASW method. But now uh, we should move to the to the next speaker. Uh, please welcome, Mr. Agustia Adimarta. Yep. Yeah, Mr. Agustia yeah. Adimarta. He is research at Research and Development Center of BMKG, expertise in gravity, geomagnetic noise tomography, and INSAR, with the main interest in noise seismic tomography. He received his doctoral in earth science from Bandung Technological Institute at 2015. And now Mr. Agustia will sharing with us about ANT or ambient noise tomography for subsurface structure imaging. Okay, uh, Mr. Agustia, you have 30 minutes. So time is yours, Mr. Agustia. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, clear. Okay. Good evening, Professor Walter Muni and Joan, and good morning to all colleagues. At this season, I will present or I will tell about the ambient noise tomography for subsurface structure imaging in PMKG. At the 2012, Saikin and Kinet have success to emit the Australia continent using the seismograph from using the stationary and portable seismograph in Australia. And then at 2014, Sulfa Krisa and the supervisor of Saikin and Bill Kumin have success to image the subsurface structure beneath central Java using Meramex data. And then at 2016, Ambient noise tomography is used to image the Jakarta is seeking and collaborate with Seismological Technic Center to deploy the seismograph in Jakarta. It's a, they use it's about more than 50 seismograph that deploy in this area and it's access to image the thickness of sedimentary of Jakarta. Then at 2017, me and my team under supervisor from Saikin also, and we have success to image the East Java subsurface structure and Bali also. And we use the data from stationary and portable seismograph data. And then last at 2020, our colleagues Bayu Pranata have success to image the basin, Bandung Basin in the in West Java area. Why the ambient tomography is interesting for us? Because the first reason is this method is passive seismic method and it used the seismograph, seismograph and this equipment is very friendly to us as PMKG employees. And if we compare to the previous method, it's like the body wave tomography. This method is effective and efficient method. If we conduct the, say, the body wave tomography research, we deploy, we can see that we deploy six, seism six seismograph and we should Need, we, we should wait the earthquake event. If the earthquake is only a few earthquakes, so we can get the good image for this research area. But in the, if, in, if we use the ambient noise tomography, if we just the same seismograph, we can see that six seismograph, we can, we can deploy the seismograph around the target Look, tar target structure. And then we can move again, move until we can get the good report, so we can get the good image from this research. 
And if we have so many seismograph, I guess it's easy for us to get the good result of the subsurface structure beneath the research area. And the, the next reason is the increasing of the number of seismograph on the Inatius network. Before 2019, we just a few seismograph in Indonesia from in Inatius in Inatius, but in 2019 there are more seismograph and Sumatra, Java, and the others area. And then in 2020 there are more again. And until in this year there are the addition of seismograph in the Indonesia area. And then the subsurface structure information is needed for us to improvement of earthquake parameter quality. This method, the first method is when you want to research the sum area, the first you should do the literature study. You should understand your research area and then you can do the data acquisition. Uh, this step is very important for us. If you have done, if you do a good acquisition and you produce the good data, so the next process, the next step is easy. But if you produce the bad data, so the next process is very difficult for us. And then if you have a good, pro good, good data, waveform data, say waveform seismic data, you can continue to process data. And then you, in my step, I use the SAC, the SAC data from seismic waveform, and then I can continue to cross correlation. And then I can extraction from this cross correlation of relic wave using the green function to get the dispersion. And then the, in the next dispersion, I can get the group velocity. And then we continue to check up for test to get the grid space and smoothing and dumping parameters. The best parameter after we can we get the best parameter, we can continue and use this the best parameter to suspect inversion. After we get of the suspect inversion, we can continue to depth inversion. You can use the neighborhood algorithm al algorithm or you can use the Bayesian method, MCMC. And then you, you can continue to interpretation of uh, and of embryo noise tomography imaging result. You can compare to the previous result. Data acquisition, this is the important step. For before you came to your location area, you should make sure that you bring the good seismograph, about the timing, about the sensor, about the digitizer. The all you should make sure that this is the good the good equipment. And then how, who dance and who, who, who long you should, who, who dance the seismograph and how long the, how long the record, re recording and how far the seismograph is depend on the, your target. If our target, this is our research area in the last, in the last, last year with Pertamina. And this, our target is say low subsurface sub structure so in this is the acute thermal area, uh, and this area we deploy the dense so so many seismograph so many seismograph in this area. This collaborate from Pertamina, UKM, and PMKG. This is our research. We make a uh, closely again with the space one hundred twenty five meters. This is more close than before. And if your target is deep subsurface and regional area, you can use our network, our Inatius network. So you can use, this is the, our research, research and R&D development research. We have image, the, we have produced the image, the Sumatra and West Java using ambient tomography. So we can use it. Maybe in the target, you we cannot, get the information at the silo, but we can get the deeper subsurface structure information. The, if we back to the waveform seismic, 
where is the source from used from the ambient noise tomography if we the source is the first source is from earthquake if we cannot we, we don't use it and then the next is ground roll from sea wave and human activity <coughs> uh, if we in the this is the seismograph uh, sorry. Uh, this is the says if we put or deploy the seismograph in the closed area we can see that number one, station one, station two, and station three. Station one and station two is close, but station two and station three is have the distance is about eight kilometer. And we can see that the signal of the earthquake is like equal. But if we zoom for this segment, for this segment, the blue, blue one, we can use it. It's like equal pattern of waveform seismic. But if we zoom again, the one and two is almost equal because the distance is, is close. The distance only 500 meters. And if we compare with the C, C oh, sorry, compare with the station three, it has the distance eight kilometer the pattern of the waveform, the same pattern, it have a delay time because uh, it, it means this is the signal from the same source. Uh, and T also, and the uh, picture, T picture T also, we can see that this is the same, almost same, but if we in the station three, there are the different time for for the same pattern cross correlation it's <coughs> related with the who long so if we who long we need the data to to process the ambient tomography and the next pro in the after we get the good data we continue to cross correlation using the green function and this is the <coughs> result of green function from the same pair of the station. This is one day, three and 20 day, because the distance only one kilometer, it's about one, it's about one kilometer, less than two kilometers. So one day and until 70, 20 day, one day and, or 20 day is almost equal. But if our pair station is more than 30 kilometer, you can see that the difference is little, uh, little more different. For one day, you can see that so noisy for result of cross correlation, but in 21 day is more clear. So if our station is half a uh, far distance, so we need so many data, maybe one years or two years or maybe five years. So until we can get the clear data of cross correlation data. This is our <coughs> last year project in R&D. This is the result of Corellogram LVLE, LIWA, LIWA in Sumatra and we produce the cross correlation liwa to the other station if we zoom like that i process we process the cross correlation use, using the one years waveform data so we produce this enough good hey, good for me maybe if, if we process two years or two years or three years data maybe it will the better result It's about this person. We can come. We can compare the this person from the close station or the far station. This is the close station. The result of period less than one second. Less than one. Sorry. Uh, oh yeah, sorry. Less than one. Less than one kilometer. You can see that five. 100 meters the uh, 
one. One. Okay. Okay. The information less than one second, less than one second period, one second. It means the the silo silver silver information. It's silo information is clear, clear. But in five kilometers, it hey, the, we can just a few information in the silo. But in the deep in the deeper is we can get the clear information. How about the far the regional data? If we use the is Java is Java. If the it's about more than the three hundred kilometers, so the information data we get the dispersion is from more than one second until the until more than ten second. Okay. Checkerboard test, but checkerboard test we if the local area research. So we can use the grid tensor. Then if we use the regional information, if we in the local use the 0.6 kilometer, but in the regional area, we use the 25 kilometers because the station in this area is more seldom than the local area. This is our case study. Uh, I'm in nice tomography and BMKG. This is the our local area study is collaborate with Pertamina. In this, we have we have conduct the seismograph in the some geothermal area since 2018 in the some geothermal production area. This is we try to deploy some seismograph. This is the ray path. It have the it's no ray path because we just have the only thirty seismograph and we move to the other area. Move again, move again. It's not not apa ya? No, not continuous all. So we can get the good information for this area. These are of course correlation because the this is the small area we can conduct the seismograph one until twenty days is different with the regional area. This is the dispersion curve I have explained about it before. This is the checkerboard test we test the try and error where is the best parameter parameterization for ambient tomography in this area in this research area this is the result of surface inflation <laughs> this is for 0 0.1 second you can see that there are the we can identify the low velocity in this area Make for hot algorithm and we process to get the info depth information using neck for hot algorithm. And then we can identify the, the fault, fault system in this area. You can see that the low velocity is spread by the fault, this fault. And then if we <coughs> try to get the information profile A and E action, and we compare to the previous result because in this area, so many fail when he try to get the reservoir targeting. If the previous study they use the magnetotelluric, magnetotelluric is detected that in this area is the rest the big reservoir. But when they try to <coughs> when they try to get the to make a well production, he just get the good in the A well production. But in the H, he don't get anything. And C only few, D only, and D two only few. 
if we see this area, it should be get the same info, same same production from the E. But in in ambient noise tomography, we can see that the in the edge well production is the high velocities. It means in this area no reservoir in no no reservoir information in this area. But in the A, there is the low velocity. It's a good reservoir. But in the T, it's also it's a high velocity. It means this is a fresh rock. If we compare the empty, is is almost equal about the pattern of the subsurface structure, but a different information about the classification of the rock. If we try to make a profile from P to P action, you can see that the G A, the A, this is the so many, <coughs> so very good, the, the best well protection in this area, we stage this, this well protection, we, we can see that this is the, it, uh, it, it, this area is identify is, um, it's so so we, we can detect the low velocity. It means this is the good reservoir area, and then the G also and C, C also. So in the ambient noise tomography, it's used for it's powerful to identify the reservoir area, especially to cute for Q thermal. And another result. <coughs> We said we can produce the information using the ambient tomography. We can produce the information of micro earthquake. Micro earthquake, we can detect the so many micro earthquake in this area because this area is <laughs> passed was is passed by Semanko Fault. This is Semanko Fault. This is the research area, and we can get also the information of special autocorrelation. We, and then it's important we can compare the result of spatial autocorrelation with the ambient noise tomography. And also microzonation, you can production the VST Gabulu from Havi SR. For the regional area study, this is our area study. We combine the seismograph stationary from PMKG data to and combine with the portable seismograph, we, we deploy we deploy the seismograph in the East Java. This is the our cross correlation. The PTGE PTGE is in Pachitan, certain part of Java, and we cross correlate with cross correlate with the others area. And then this is the PVGE. This is the dispersion curve. We can see that the information is good in the period more than one second. This checkerboard test. This is the suspicious invention result. We can detect the <coughs> we we can identify the southern mountain zone and Kendeng zone. This is the in the sand in the middle is Kendeng zone. In the southern part is the Rembang zone. This is they have the different morphology. This is the neighborhood algorithm. We process to get the subsurface structure in the tip in the tap. This is the sine wave velocity. This is the Matful Kano area, and this is the Madura Strait. Then the Madura Strait, there are uh, so there are uh, it's there are the so some of the exploitation gas gas exploitation and exploration sorry exploration gas and also in the mud in the land of Jaff in Kendeng land. If the if the result of the profile not sort of uh, east west profile. You can see that the mud volcano is it, it, it identified by the low velocity and Madura Strait also. This area, two of this area is KF get the mud volcano event. 
this is the cross section this is the not short <coughs> not short cross section this is the mudful canoe area this is the madura street that the mudful canoe area is identified so low velocity than the others area <coughs> Nowadays, because of BMKG have deployed the seismograph in so, so many seismograph in Indonesia. So we try to get the information of subsurface structure beneath Indonesia using ambient tomography. Our first project is we have finished the, <coughs> our tomography in Sumatra and West Java area. You can see that this is the Smanko file. This is the VS information. And if we compare with the previous result that using the tensor seismograph that they have deployed so many seismograph is from KFZ scan at the from the paper scan with 2010, the information is almost same, it's equal that the northern part, I say, the eastern part of, of Semanko, of Semanko in this area, in the black areas, black square area, is dominated by low velocity. And in the western part of the Semanko is dominated by high velocity. So it's good for us if we produce the good imaging to get the to improve our to improve our param, earthquake parameterization conclusion i mean tomography is very useful for modeling the subsurface and it's effective and efficient than the previous method and ambient tomography can be used to image subsurface structure locally or regionally based on your research area targeting and then the data from the amnesty tomography can be used to generate micro earthquake information, special autocorrelation, and micro zonation or VS30 also information. And the most crucial step to produce a good imaging of tomography is start for, from the good acquisition, good equipment. And then the last is we can use our newest Inatius network to produce subsurface imagery in, for subsurface imaging in Indonesia. It is enough. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Agustia, for your presentation. Uh, maybe we open, uh, we continue with the discussion about the INT topic. Maybe anyone here want to give a comment or uh, anyone here want to ask with uh, Mr. Agustia? Please, you uh, can write it on the column chat or uh, use your raise hand feature. And maybe before, uh, Walter, you have, or Walter or USGS team, you have any comment or question for Mr. Agustia? Yes, um, excellent talk, and uh, this is uh, very impressive, and you have shown excellent results. Uh, my question is: Could could you repeat, please, uh, which period which period data you have you from nine seconds to forty seconds, or, or can you show the slide showing which period okay. you can measure? Sorry, in the regional, I can get the fifty second period. But in the local regional, I, I only get at the five second period. Uh, but you have a period, a period range, a range of periods. What, what's the range of period? Period of the, sorry. Yeah. Local or regional? Local, local. Local, and local I only get the, uh, I only get the 
three the good the good period we i i only get at the three until five period three to five seconds uh, yeah, a period three of three to five, five. seconds okay and then for the regional what's the period range for the regional for the regional i can get the information for sumatra sorry i i don't so about the all sumatra list result it's just a sample i in this area in this area i get the good period is from from 5 until 60 second oh that's very good you can you can do uh, you can do a lot of good work with 5 to 60 second that's yeah enough to go into the below the moho uh, lower crust and moho even. Yeah. Very good. Maybe I will continue to make a paper and I will discuss to Prof. Murni to yes. improve our paper. Can we look at the uh, velocity depth function? Uh, your slide, some slide you have the velocity depth function? Oh, uh, yeah. Are uh, you seeing the... This is... Oh, this uh, one, sorry. this one. Uh, yeah. Yes, can you uh, explain one more time this uh, this yeah. result? Yeah, this is the that's this are this is the different zone, different stru structure, and the first in the first one the velocity is this is the from Rembang zone. Rembang zone is the middle middle vs middle hard in the area in this research area, but in this area is very low low velocity in this area in the zo kendeng zone if you ever listen about the mud volcano event yes yeah this is the area of mud volcano event uh, and then and the <coughs> point of triple three this is the southern mountain zone is dominated by high velocity this is the high hard, hard rock in this area so I can produce in this area. I can produce only. It's about the good. The good data is from period one until 50, 50, 15, 15 second period. So uh, in in this inversion, the uh, velocity in the middle yeah. is very low. Only. 1,000 meters per second between four, uh, four kilometer and uh, 11 kilometer, low yeah. velocity zone. Yeah. This area is dominated by deep, the, the, the thickness of sedimentary. And until no, no, but no, oh, we cannot get the bedrock of, of this area. No, we cannot get the good information about the bedrock of the uh, of this area so very low if we this is our and actually this area is near of my home i come from this area and uh -huh. when yeah, when before before earthquake before mud volcano explosion before mud volcano explosion the water is still fresh water but after mud volcano explosion, the water is different. It's is is no is salt salt salty. Salty water. water. Yeah, and yeah, I think it's because the so maybe in it is the the deep basin in this area. Okay, one last one last question. When you look at the seismic data, the seismic stations, how many seismic stations you cannot use and how many stations are okay? Yeah. yeah. In this, for the example, for deployment for, for this area, I use the all seismic, the all seismic station because before the when when they deploy the seismograph, I I make the the standard op, standard operation to when they deploy the seismograph before they finish the deployment in the installation 
finish the installation, they should check the MASW uh, HVS air quality. And then yeah. you can, you should check the PSD information. It's, you should make sure that the data is good. If the data not good, you you can move to the to the other area. Yeah. So we can get the all is the good data. Maybe only one or two is not good. And what about for regional study? For regional ah, <laughs> for regional study because we use the stationary station. I from one hundred I can, hey, let's say. From 100, I just say I just use the 70 station. Yeah, it's okay. Normal, yeah, normal situation, yeah. normal problem. <laughs> Thank you very much for your, yeah. pre your excellent presentation and wonderful result. Thank you very much for your question, for your advice also. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Agustia and Mr. Walter. Uh, in Zoom chat, Mr. Walter and Mr. Agustia, there is a question for for you, uh, for all speaker, maybe. In MASW, SPAC, and ANT, the initial data is surface wave, but why after inversion, the result was S or shear wave? Why? Uh, maybe uh, someone, uh, Walter or Mr. Agustia or Mrs. Joan uh, can explain about this question. So, uh, Joanne, can you explain how you go from Rayleigh wave to S wave? Um. So we are looking at the dispersive property of surface wave. So it is looking at the different the different phase velocity um, at each frequency component. And three inversion. Hello? Yeah, we hear you. Hear you. Yeah, okay. we still hear you. Go ahead. With release squares inversion, we... Okay, I think, we'll, I think we do yeah. lose you. We do, we do lose you. I can try to answer this question. So um, the raw data from the MASW for the Rayleigh wave will be the Rayleigh wave phase velocity. That's the velocity at a given period. So for example, it will be the velocity of the Rayleigh wave at 10 second period. When you have many periods measured, for example, for one second, two seconds, four seconds, eight seconds, 12 seconds, then you can make an inversion from all of the phase velocities to get the total shear wave velocity. So uh, this only requires that you make an assumption about the relationship, a standard relationship between the shear wave and the density. So uh, this is discussed in um, every textbook every textbook on uh, seismology, how to go from phase velocity measurements to shear wave velocity measurements. It's a very good, very good question. Hey, Walter, uh, maybe anyone here want to ask about the ANT or uh, our topic before? Uh, maybe uh, Mr. Suprianto, maybe? Uh, you have any comment or question for Mr. Agustia? No, I'm not expert in the uh, uh, ambient stomography. Okay. I'm just. Uh, it's our boss. 
so, so many questions about the uh, amenities and also in the spa. I'm still in the skeptic uh, June, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. okay, I have uh, I have one more one more question. Oh yes, please, uh, Mr. Walter. If you are living in uh, Africa or in uh, Northern Europe, is it a job? No, no. If you're living in Africa or Northern Europe, uh, you have very few earthquakes, and ambient noise tomography is wonderful because you have no local seismic sources. However, in Indonesia, you have many, many earthquakes. Uh, and every earthquake has a P arrival time and an S arrival time. So why use ambient noise seismic tomography in Indonesia when you can just as well use local earthquake tomography? Thank you for your uh, question, for your answer, please. Thank Very you. good question. <laughs> Bagos, please. Yeah, thank Might you. Be, thank, uh, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Walter Muni. And not not all Indonesia region have the micro earthquake. For the example, in our new project is with Pak Supri, is my Pak Supri is my good boss. They give me the some give us give us some project to to imaging the Semarang. Semarang is southern part of Java, the central cap capital of Central Java, and this area there are the some fault. There are the Lassam fault and Semarang fault, and it this is the there are the active fault. And this area is very seldom, the very rare, the earthquake event. So it's needed to us to, in this year, we deploy the seismograph in this area. And then we, we, we to get the inf subsurface, to get the inf subsurface information, especially to get the information of the fault, Semarang fault. And the, and also in the <coughs> OPA, for the example OPA, OPA, OPA is the active fault in the Yogyakarta. Yogyakarta is the northern part of Java also. Is Semarang is south, is, is, sorry, Semarang in the north and Yogyakarta in the south, so, so in the southern part of Java. And this area, they are the fault, but the earthquake is rare. It's enough, I guess, rare, the, the earthquake. So if we want to image the fault system in this area, it's difficult and we need so many time to deploy the seismograph. So because our budgeting is no, it's only, yeah, much but few. <laughs> it's middle budgeting, it, no no much budgeting. So I, I, I can, I, we maybe, our deployment is only for three months. So if we focus at the body wave tomography, we can get the, the information on, about the subsurface structure. Because no, not not to if in the maybe in the subduction area, so many earthquakes, but in the in the onshore, in the on in the land, it's seldom earthquake. The earthquake is very seldom. Thank you, Pa Walter, Prof. Walter Muni. Excuse me. Sorry, st still mute. You're still mute, Walter. Uh, another, another answer uh, is suggested by the lecture from uh, Ms. Joanne Chan. She said that in USGS, we use every method, every method, MASW, refraction, tomography, and gravity, and, and uh, ambient noise. So I think your work is very important uh, because it is, um, it doesn't have to, it doesn't need to replace tomography, 
but it can be used together, together with other method. So your work is, is very good. Thank you for your, your reply. Welcome. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Agustia and Mr. Walter. For uh, last chance, maybe uh, anyone here want to ask uh, with our speaker? Uh, so, I think we... I think, excuse me, Mbak Audi. Yeah. Maybe uh, I give a little uh, answer about the Pak Walter question. Yes, please, Why in uh, Indonesia is uh, also use the ANT tomography? Uh, but uh, Indonesia have so many earthquakes. Why we use the ANT? I think right what the Pak say that the some area I cannot be resolved by in the dilatant tomography. And also the distribution and also the depth of the earthquake uh, is uh, limited uh, of the distribution. And also uh, in the delay, delay time uh, tomography, there is a lack of the S width resolution of the image by inversion of the uh, uh, tomography. And also because Indonesia have uh, so many big ocean waves that is a good source for the ambient noise tomography. Thank you, Mbak Oti. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Supriyanto Hadi, for your explanation. I think our time is uh, over. So we must end our session in this morning. Once again, I say thank you to Mr. Walter, to Mrs. Joan, and Mr. Agustia for great presentation and explanation. Uh, give applause also for all participants. Uh, so next for uh, next agenda, we'll lead by Mr. Supriyanto Rohaidi uh, as the moderator in the second session today. But before we go into the are you Next kidding? Session. <laughs> yeah, uh, according to the schedule, uh, oh, yeah. after after we have we have five minutes to breaks, uh, and after breaks, uh, the moderator air is Mr. Suprianto Rohadi. Okay, so uh, enjoy your break time and see you again. Uh, How long goodbye, break time, everyone. Mbak yeah. How long break time? Uh, five minutes. Five okay. minutes for break time. Okay. Yeah. So maybe we we back again in ten five, Pak Suprianto. Is it okay. okay? Thank okay. you. Okay. Okay. Uh, so enjoy your break time and see you again. Goodbye.
Oh, mau air di dalam benda yang mudah menyerap air. Uh, hello everyone. Good morning. Are you ready? Because it's time ten uh, five. Uh, Excuse me. Yes. Good. Yeah. Good evening uh, in America. Yeah. Maybe we continue the session. Yes. We have uh, two speaker. First yes. one is Miss Joanna, and second second speaker is uh, Pak Ramdan. Yes. Uh, Ms. Joanna, you have uh, one hour for presentation. And Pak Ramdan have uh, 35 minutes. I think it is not fire. Yeah. Okay. Please. Okay, maybe uh, we can start now. Uh, yeah. Mr. Okay. John, please, welcome. Ms. Ms. Joanna, are you ready to start? Hello. Uh, Walter. Kirain tadi Joanna yang yang bicara Mbak Juna. Iya nggak mungkin. Suaranya sama sama Mbak Juna. Masa sih? <laughs> Pak Supri maunya itu. <laughs> Walter, Walter, uh, or Joanna, are you ready to start? Maybe uh, the next speaker uh, from you. Ini tidak usah baca CV tadi udah ya Mbak ya? Iya, ayah, Joanna, ayah, bisa. Ya, mau langsung gimana Pak Supri? Mau langsung atau gimana? Apa langsung apa? udah waktunya ya. Sampai jam berapa? Sampai jam sampai jam dua setengah satu. Halo, ya. Joanna. Halo, Joanna. Are you ready? Hello. Yeah, are you ready? Okay. Uh, yes, I am. Okay. okay. So everyone can hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah. Very good. Go back to. So uh, I actually. Chan will talk about the Northern uh, California case study and also the Southern California case study. Uh, she have uh, one hour for talk about um, seismicity, maybe, or research into region. Okay, Joanna, time is yours. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want to actually let everyone know that I included my Northern California case study in my previous lecture. That's so Napa. So Napa is in Northern California. Now we are in Southern California. Um, Southern California is just 
is actually more seismically active than Northern California. Just in recent history, there's the um, 1999 Hector Mine earthquake. That was a magnitude 7.1, I believe. Um, and then in 1994, it was the magnitude 6.7 San Fernando Valley earthquake. And then also further back in time, there's the 1872 Owens Valley earthquake that was, um, I believe, magnitude 7.0 or 7.2. So Southern California is very seismically active. Um, and so I will let's get started on this case study. So those, okay. So if you can see the little map um, of the United States on the left, we are in the southern part of California. Uh, I hope you can see the little white square on the bottom. So we're close to the Mexico border actually. And then the picture on the right is a zoomed in um, location of our study area. And this is called the Dos Palmas Preserve. And you can see that body of water, uh, that body of water is called the Salton Sea and the San Andreas Fault is just um, kind of running north, northwest, um, kind of adjacent to Salton Sea. So our study area is very close to the San Andreas Fault. Um, okay. So why are we here in Dos Palmas Preserve? This is actually a desert area. <laughs> very dry. So why are we here? Um, so we were here, we were asked to investigate um, the water supply here. Um, the desert pupfish and it's, is actually endangered, it's threatened, it's found in very few places um, in the United States. And the Dos Palmas Preserve is one um, of the areas where they exist and they are trying to um, protect the species. And they asked, if this is a, another federal agency asking us to perform the work there. And the reason is because they noticed that their water supply to this preserve has been uh, decreasing. Um, and so they wanted to know uh, whether the faults, um, whether there are any faults on that property and how it's affecting the water flow. Um, and because they're concerned about um, the wildlife there and especially the desert pupfish. So the goal of our study was to image the upper part of the aquifer basin the, of the system and to locate any faults that may affect the groundwater flow. And I'm including this study because we're using MASW in a little slightly different way out in the desert. So this is mostly flat, <laughs> flat area. So this is um, a more closed up image of our study area. Um, you can see the, the purple, purple line is our seismic profile. It's about two kilometers long. And you can see that there is a mapped fault kind of just to the uh, Western end of the profile, the Hidden Springs Fault. And then you can see the San Andreas Fault, um, I guess approximately about three kilometers away from our study area, three to four kilometers away. And this is mostly, this is desert, so it's mostly quaternary alluvium. Okay, another more closed in um, image of the SARS seismic profile. So you can see actually the, um, where there's screen, it's actually vegetations. So you, we can kind of see where the vegetation is aligned with some of the mapped faults because faults tend to act as a barrier to water flow. And so water tends to collect at faults as well. So we can sometimes see palm trees or vegetations growing along or adjacent to a fault. And the pupfish ponds are kind of in the Eastern end of the profile. So we spend about 10 days out in the desert and we actually used a cable system. We had four 60 channel um, seismographs. So we operate 240 channels at once and we move the spread over. So this is also an active source acquisition where we um, generate a source at every geophone and it was approximately five meter spacing. 
for the seismic study. And this is just a photo showing us with the cable system. And of course our crew, because it is, I think we did this survey in the summer. Um, it was very hot. So we used two different sources. We used a sledgehammer uh, at every geofilm location. And we also use a size gun at every uh, 50 meters. So this is just, um, if you haven't seen a size gun before, this is just a short video um, of the size gun in action. So this just, the size gun just helps us um, propagate the signal further. So we had a size gun at every 50 meter of the profile and then a sledgehammer at every um, five meters along the profile. So we have um, P wave seismic refraction results. So we only collected um, P wave data for this study because it was, um, we used a cable system and we only, it would just be, it would take too much time and effort. <laughs> and also, uh, we, and, constraints, we could only um, acquire P wave data because collecting S wave would mean that we would have to restart everything and switch out the geophones to an S wave geophone. Okay, so this is the P wave seismic refraction results showing the upper um, 100 meters um, uh, of the subsurface. So there is a little bit of topography on the um, kind of the eastern end of the profile, but this is actually, there's a five times a vertical exaggeration. So um, it's actually, it's quite, it looks quite flat when it's, uh, when there's no vertical exaggeration. So this is the reason why I am showing this case study because we did not collect S-wave data. So we do not have any shear wave results from um, S-wave refraction tomography. That's why we use MESW to get a, a approximate shear wave velocity for the profile. Um, so this is the S-wave velocity, the, the shear wave velocity results from MESW analysis. Okay. And this is really the reason why um, we, we used MESW is so we could um, generate a VP over VS model. And from prior studies, um, as I mentioned in the NAPA, NAPA um, case study, um, from prior studies, high VP over VS just usually suggests a saturate or um, a fault zone. And we can see um, higher VP and VS ratios over um, the uh, Western half of the profile. And then it kind of drops um, in the eastern half of the profile. And then we have Poisson's ratio. Again, um, similarly to um, VB over VS, value Poisson's ratio of point of 0.44 or higher indicates a saturated fault zone. Um, so this just tells us that um, the ground, the subsurface is quite saturated, but we can see from the, the depth of the saturation that there is a obvious drop to that zone of saturation over to the Eastern end of the profile. And this is the, and from the velocity results, we were able to obtain a seismic reflection results. And then I have the, um, uh, topography, um, that's the, the figure A. And again, this is at a five um, vertical exaggeration. So it looks like it's, there's a mountain on the, on the right-hand side, but it's, it's actually quite flat here. So this is a zoomed in um, result of precise reflection with some interpret, fault interpretation. 
Um, we identified three fault zones across the profile. Um, we labeled it Z1, Z2, and Z3. We also have existing well data that we could correlate with um, our velocity results and also our, um, uh, to, to figure out the top of the groundwater table. And we see a, a zone, a very fractured zone, kind of in the middle of the profile, which We could see actually in the VP and over VS, but this is actually the VS shear wave velocity overlaying on top of the seismic reflection results, showing that there's a higher velocity on the eastern side of the profile. And then this is the VP over VS over um, overlaying the seismic reflection. And where we had interpreted that um, dense zone of fault fractures in zone three, which is in, sort of in the middle of the profile. That's actually also where that um, VP over VS, the higher ratios kind of drop. That's kind of where the dividing zone is. So, and also where we interpreted that there is a fault that has not been previously mapped before. So our conclusion, to this study is that there is a variable depth to aquifer as we could see from the tomography results and from the VP over VS and the Poisson's ratios. And there is significant vertical offsets across fault zone. And that was quite obvious from the VP over VS and the Poisson's ratios where it's um, the, <clears throat> the offsets are quite, it's, it's lower on the Eastern end of the profile. And that we identified at least three fault zones based on Again, VP over VS and Poisson's ratios. And some faults may affect the distribution of shallow perched aquifers. So we were able to identify fault zones that were not previously mapped in this area. And so this is why, and this is a method that, this is why we use MASW is because we could not acquire S-wave data to, um, to model S-wave refraction tomography. And so this was a way for us to use MESW to obtain results. That was very helpful to us. And this study has been published um, as a OUSGS open file report. So if anybody would like to actually see the, the details of this work, you can look for us, for, look for it um, on our website, on the USGS website. And that concludes my study for the Southern California case study. If anybody has any questions about the Southern California study, I would be happy to answer them.
Any problem, Joanna? Oh, I'm just <laughs> waiting for questions. If anybody had questions about the Southern California uh, case study. Oh, <laughs> I think you you should continue with uh, like presentation first, and then we can uh, discuss later. <clears throat> so I have a question, Joanne. Mm -hmm. You report um, the results from Southern California uh, using MASW, and of course you get the shear wave velocity, VS, but you said you did not use seismic refraction. So how did you get the VP? We did, we collected VP data or uh, P wave data, but we did not collect S wave data due I to see. time and budget constraints. So you were recording vertical only? Yes, and this is, and this is why I, um, I chose this study to talk about is because this is um, an instance, it's rare that we do not collect S wave data. And, and, and so this is how we use MASW is to get that shear wave velocity data so that we, in combination with the P wave refraction tomography, then we can obtain um, VP over VS and Poisson's ratios. So you are showing the pictures of VP and VS. Could you mm -hmm. just clarify for us whether the structure looks very similar, whether you know the, the, the shallow velocity layer is, shows up as about the same thickness for low velocity P as lo low velocity S. Are, are the v, are, is the P wave refraction consistent with? With the MASW? You mean? Yeah, yeah. Let's see here. It looks like it's very, very comparable. It's, I, um, it, the, um, the high velocity structure on the Eastern end of the profile is very obvious for MASW. And you can kind of see that there is a topography correct, elevation correction or um, elevation data for the P wave seismic refraction. But again, yeah, so there's the also image... a five vertical exaggeration. Mm. It's, there's a vertical exaggeration here. So it looks like there's a mountain. On the so side. can we look at VPVS? Yeah, so on the right-hand side, also known as the east end of the profile mm -hmm. or yeah ne east end then you do have the blue the blue zone with low low, low mm -hmm. yes ratio yeah and and what is the red on the uh, west end of the profile that is on the left side below the green that it, we are interpreting that to be a shallow aquifer oh and because there is um we interpreted faults um, kind of in the middle, that there, there are unmapped faults near the middle of that profile. And so we interpret that, that the aquifer table, that the fault um, act as a barrier of groundwater flow from west to east. But the typical VPVS for uh, granite would be 1.73. But you have values like eight, Eight, yeah. yeah. Excuse me. I want to ask about the legend. V VP over VS ratio is uh, in range of two until eight. Is it correct? Can you can you repeat that question? The question the is: comment? VP VS doesn't go, doesn't doesn't go to a value of eight. Eight is too big, too large a value. VPVS. Yeah. Let me see if I can see the legend. No, not not in the diagram. In the in the explanation. In the explanation, you know, in prior in Rufus's prior studies, um, he did um uh, across San Andreas Fault um in San mm. Mateo and Crystal Springs that he did obtain VP over VS values of eight at the fault zone. Okay, but. We don't know of any rock that has that value, so it's uh, it's a surprising result. It's hard to give a physical interpretation. Okay, so 
It's a very high value. Mm -hmm. For a granite, it's 1.7. And for a sediment, it's about 2.5. Yeah. But, yeah. but eight. What, what eight. about for like a saturated sand? Yeah. Out of my knowledge, out of my expertise. So I don't, I don't know. <laughs> saturated would, sand, maybe. Yeah, maybe something. I would think just something that's very saturated would be close to a value of seven or eight. Okay, so what the value of eight means that the, the P wave velocity is uh, high. High. The S wave velocity is extremely low. low. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it should be some sort of uh, almost a liquid, like uh, getting close to very, very saturated sand. So P there wave is velocity a, is fine, but the, okay. But you can see there is a, um, a well there that we were able to correlate with the top of the, the, the water table. Very interesting result. Yeah, maybe other question from the mm -hmm. participant. I think in the chat room. Yeah. Oh, the reflection, okay. Reflection. So it's this one. How did I, or how, how did we <laughs> interpret the three fault zones? So it's not strictly from this seismic reflection result. Like I mentioned in my previous lecture, we compare everything that we have using MESW and a refraction tomography, and, and also from BP over VS and um, Poisson's ratio. So these three zones would, um, so, and this is how I interpret it. And because this is actually Rufus Catching's interpretation that I am trying to describe here, that there is, he is looking at where there is a, a high value um, based on, uh, he's also looking at the velocity contours. So there is, um, let's see, okay, here we go that there is um, a trough here or a, or a valley a shape. If there's a fall here, then it's kind of impeding groundwater flow. So I, I believe this is how he interprets it, that there is a fault here, um, kind of near the, you can see, cause you can't see my cursor, but on the kind of on the, Western and there is a trough there. And that's one zone that he interprets as a barrier to groundwater flow. So it's, it's discontinuous. And then his second zone is kind of in the middle. That's also, you can kind of see um, kind of a difference in elevation of the top of the water table. And then his first, his third, um, zone is more to the eastern side of the profile. And I believe he interpreted that from this image, from, from, a comp, from, from, you know, like I said, a combination of all the results that there is a discrepancy in the velocity structure at depth. <clears throat> okay. So the question is, um, one question could be, whether if you gave five different people the same sets of data, would they mm -hmm. all interpret? come up with the same three yeah. zones? With the similar background and experience, I think so. They would, they would come, if they have similar background and experience, they would do the same because they're all wrong or because they're all right. Maybe it's just bias. Maybe it's, it's just, you know. It's, it's, it's just interpretation based on your personal experience um, okay. from prior and, uh, studies. Right, that's right. The, okay, good. Fabriani has another question for you. Yeah. Um, vertical exaggeration. What is it 
what is that and why? Okay, so vertical exaggeration is so it, we could bring up, because this is a very flat area, we use vertical exaggeration, I think up to five, um, to kind of highlight the, the difference. So it's easier to see, basically. No, no, he's asking, what is vertical exaggeration? Oh, what, what is, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, vertical exaggeration is um, kind of stretching where the vertical length or distance is more than the length. More than so the horizontal. We, more, the, more than the horizontal, right. So that we could see the, the difference in vertical structures better. Does that? Yeah, so the, that the, the model is, is stretched, stretched, as you said, vertically to, so what's the purpose of, why, why do it? Why, what's the purpose of doing that? It's so we could see just, right. because this is a um, two kilometer profile. Um, a lot of the, it, the, the things that we want to, to see, like the location of faults, they're very subtle. Um, so vertical exaggeration brings out that subtle, you know, uh, um, that subtle um, image for us of where a fault could be located. Well, I think you can say that <clears throat> there are many imaging techniques that you mm -hmm. can use false cover, color, you can use many imaging techniques. Vertical exaggeration is, is just, just, one. A, just one of them, and it's a simple one, a very simple one to stretch the vertical stretch. axis. Right. We can, you know, we, instead of vertical exaggeration, we could change the color. <laughs> That's, you know, just, just um, a way to highlight um, to make um, features a little more clear. Right, right, I agree. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Ms. John. Uh, is there any question more from PSKT? PSGT, PSKT. Mas Adi Santoso, any question? Mbak Audi atau Mbak Ida Yanti atau Mbak Dewi Inta? Pak Supri. Ya. Yeah. Uh, Ramdan Pak Supri. Oh ya, yeah. please Pak Ramdan. Uh, excuse me. Uh, so many so many method for shallow structure. What is consideration you uh determine use this method because i think it's shallow enough yeah why you didn't use uh geopenetrating radar uh, which have more practice and cheaper yeah ground penetrating radar yeah oh, ground why, penetrating radar okay why you choose this method no, oh, because no. uh, radar is more practice and cheap, cheaper and cheaper. Yeah. Okay, please, John. Okay. Um, I guess the quickest, <laughs> the simplest answer is we don't have a ground penetrating radar equipment. Oh, um, yeah. So that's the simplest uh, answer. And the second is because. I've used ground penetrating radar for when I was in school, actually. And it was only really useful for certain locations. Um, I used it in, in a sand dune where it was clean sand. Um, and I, I really was only concerned with the upper 10 meters of the subsurface. Um, so a lot of times for ground, for fault studies, say it may not be able to image um, based on, depending on the geologic material, there could be attenuation um, if there is um, yeah. metal or if there is brackish saline water. So it's right. GPR is, is good for certain applications in certain locations. And for our needs, um, it, it's, it doesn't always apply to the, to the goals. 
So I think uh, <clears throat> the answer that she gave is very accurate. Uh, this group is using MASW, is using many different kinds of sources, yeah. hammer, shotgun, explosion, using seismic refraction tomography for P wave and S wave. And these are the most common techniques of this group. Maybe other people would like to use resistivity studies or ground penetrating radar or gravity. But uh, Joanne's group is specializes in uh, a variety of seismic techniques using different instrumentation and different sources. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pakos. Maybe before you continue you. with that next presentation, I one I have one question, not technical question. John, how many person and how long you can carry out the uh, reflection uh, survey? How many? How big is your field crew for a reflection survey for a uh, for, for this project? Yeah, for, for this, this project. particular project. Um, well, you can you can say uh, you can say two. You have two case examples. You have you have yeah. Southern California and Napa. Okay, for oh. this for Southern California for this project, I believe we had a crew of 10, okay. 10 people. And for the Napa, the Northern California project, we had about twenty five people. How many days? That was five days. Okay, for the actual, for the active part of it. Um, but there was maybe two months of preparation before the actual active part of it, which was five days. Yeah, this one, uh, the Southern California desert was about 10 days. But uh, how, how many people in the core group? How many people core in group. the Five the people. Central group, five. The central group, there's five of us. And mm. then uh, the other people are students and volunteers. Students and, and volunteers or um, our colleagues from a different group. And what is the software, John? Software? Um, yeah. GFC? For the, no, for the MASW, we use Size Imager. Oh, Size Imager. By Geo. Geometrics, geometrics. And, and you're satisfied with seismic imager? It's it's okay? Size imager? Yeah. It does, yeah. It does exactly what, it, what we need it to do. And, it, and it, for the seismic refraction, uh, Mark Goldman is using Promax. Promax, and uh, that's just for, you know, processing. Right, of um, course. And then for the um, inversion? Inversion, we use John Hole's inversion program. Yeah, yeah. It open access program. I think oh. the, pro the program is published and open access. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe I can have that program. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and also teach how to operate. Might be in the next uh, training. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think uh, there is no question anymore. Uh, you can continue with your next presentation, John. So next speaker uh, is from BMKG. Oh, from BMKG. Okay, Faranda. Oops. Yeah. Okay, Faranda. Thank you, Joanne. Great job. Yeah. Access me. Share screen. Okay, let uh, me introduce you to participants, maybe, all of the PMKG participants. Already know you, who you are. Uh, Mr. Ramdan, Dr. Ramdan, graduate from the uh, uh, PhD from the ITP, and also master degree from the ITP, and also uh, S1, apa? Sarjana. That we, uh, from the ITP2. Uh, Dr. Randam will uh, give presentation about the uh, catalog, PMG earthquake catalog. 
I think this is a very interesting topic uh, about catalog because the catalog is very important for the seismology to conduct and the other uh, research of the earth science. Okay, Paramdan, please you welcome. You can uh, continue your presentation. Time is yours, Paramdan. Okay. Uh... You can see my screen? Yeah, very good. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Pa Supri, for the opportunity. Uh, I will present our work uh, in Center for Earthquake and Tsunami. Center for Earthquake and Tsunami, uh, BMKG Earthquake Catalog. Uh, uh, my position now is senior researcher in the Center for Earthquake and Tsunami. Okay, background. The first background. Uh, nowadays, uh, BMKG have more than 400 station seismic. Uh, since 2020, more than 400 station seismic have been installed around Indonesia. Uh, every color so the kind of seismic station uh, like BMKG CIA green, uh, old green, it's a corporation BMKG, BMK, BMKG with China and young green corporation BMKG with Gapjet yellow BMKG with CTBTO, etc. Okay. Uh, in BMKG, BMKG uh, even uh, at the beginning, uh, pick uh, automatic using STA-LTA. And then uh, seismologists in BMKG pick manually to get the event uh, before entering before entering to the catalog all all event all, all or all a quick picking pick manually uh, we get all parameter like origin time uh, x uh, origin time epicenter and depth and also if magnitude had more than five uh, the source mechanism also be computed uh, all parameter entered uh, enter to the catalog bmkg of course in the catalog is uh, catalog says compi uh, need to be processed to get the precise hypocenter. For expand processing, many methods uh, have been used. Uh, one of the method is double difference, but it's double de difference it's for local earthquake because Indonesia is uh, have big area, so we use uh, Spherical coordinate, the method using teletomodidi uh, by PC check at all. Uh, sample, if we have area interest in the red block, uh, red box, uh, we use a velocity model from Median Toro and Pander Hills uh, using regional velocity. And out of the area, use uh, AK one three five velocity model from Brian Kenneth at all. And we have used three D velocity. And then uh, from April two thousand and nine to December 2000 and 
19, there were 72,616 earthquake. Uh, we really quoted the Hippo Center with the method, with the certain criteria, we get, we got 5,233 uh, relocated Hippo Center. And this Hippo Center is so important for advanced tectonic studies in Indonesia. Uh, before the period, uh, BMKG Seismicity, uh, BMKG Catalog Data, could, could we get in ISG data? And now we, we try to collect BMKG data before this period to relocate, to relocate, to relocate to be relocated. Okay, in this, this is a station we use for the data, because the data until 2019, so we just use 320 station, because now the station have not been installed yet. At the at this time at that time period, uh, of course we we not only use the BMKG station network but also international seismic network because we use a spherical coordinate. Uh, this is a epicenter shifting. The majority epicenter shifting. Uh, less than 10 kilometer and depth shifting, the majority shifting from uh, negative 10 to 10 kilometer. And this is a distribution of magnitude we use for this study. Okay. If we Look more detail. We we can use this data for updating active fall in one area. It's a example in Palu Koro fall in segment Palu. Uh, this is a original catalog from BMKG. Of course, we can we can we cannot do anything in this data because so many fixed depth here. Uh, after relocated uh, geologists, so happy look this uh, data because uh, when you when we using QGIS data using a simple method using heat method, geologists can uh, geologists can use this uh, can you can interpret this data to delineate the active fall in the area. Uh, the factor, this is the factor shifting relative to relative to BMKG earthquake catalog. And this uh, majority shifting to not is direction. So uh, geologist, uh, my friend Priya Budi is geologist. So, he interpret this data to make uh, to delineate it to delineate the active fall in the Palu Koro fault in segment Palu. So I think uh, if we look this data, uh, we can use update active fall in around Indonesia. Uh, of course, with certain criteria, uh, the Hippo Center. Uh, and, we, and we can see why the Palu earthquake 
didn't propagate to not not area because here there is step over uh, according to geologists <laughs> and they uh, and uh, they uh, and the uh, after shock propag propagate to the short path this is a uh, one sample uh, this saw the earthquake propagate to the short path if you if we use bmkg earthquake catalog we can we can interpret we could not interpret the interface zone in the inter after relocated after relocating we can see uh why uh to to factor why the earthquake couldn't could not propagate to not fat because no interface zone in the northern part. The interface zone uh, exists in the southern part zone. And we can, uh, with relocated data, we can look so some phenomena in one uh, earthquake. This is a uh, sample or this is a sample of example of catalog data in BMKG uh, with double difference format it's mini upper part it's before relocated before relo, uh, before relocated and the one part is after relocated we didn't change the arrival time the arrival time data is still same. We just updating origin time, epicenter, depth. So if we plus travel time with origin time, the value is same. This plus this, same with this plus this. We didn't change the arrival time data we just changed the model uh, hypocenter model okay uh, if we if we see in more detail in banda area in aa accent the verti the vertical cross section as accent cross part of east nusa tenggara including sumba island Part of West Nusa part of West Nusa Tenggara and the southern mass southern mass of Sulawesi and BB accent cross Timur Island Alor Island and Southeast Sulawesi NCC accent NCC accent cross Leti Island Wetter Island and Remang Island Tuburu Island and the DD accent cross bandasi region from Aru Island to south of Buru Island. If we look more detail, sorry, in our accent, the activities, the seismic activities in the our accent, majority cause of Subduction Sumba uh, so, the vertical section accent so seismic activities occur in shallow depth down to 600 kilometer seismic city at depth 0 to 300 kilometer was caused by the subduction activity in the south of Sumba Island. The black line is so John interface John and the green line is so slab one zero. The blue line so 
seismic activity related to Flores Black Actras and the Black Circle saw a seismic zone related to detachment slab or I don't know if uh, related to upwelling mantle, it's need to uh, advanced study. And the circle, orange circle, it's, I think it's related to, related to slab pool activity. In BB accent, uh, black lens so or interface zone, Black line so interface John in more than 200 kilometers so of bending slab uh, related to slab pool I think and in more than 500 kilometer circle orange it's so deflection slab because uh, the slab cannot cannot penetrate to the lower mantle because uh, there are different density between upper mantle and lower mantle. And the blue circle, blue circle, blue circle related to the flores back actras. Okay. Uh, CC accent related to the Green, green silker relate related to the serum subduction zone, and from shot related to the timor sub subduction zone, and blue circle and. Purple circle related to the related to the active pole in that area. In the accent, so a subduction slab from the east to the west pass through the through the Bandasi region from Aru Island to the south of Buru Island. According to the focal mechanism solution, most of the earthquakes along this section have a strike slip mechanism. The center of Banda Ak detached vertically, forming a giant strike slip pole. A shallow seismicity cluster, 0 to 100 km depth, indicated the Aruga Graben John, John in the blue, blue circle. Another shallow seismicity cluster in the purple ellipse was caused by local shallow falls and the volcanic activity of Mount Banda Api. And what we can what we can do again with this data? We can uh, we can compute the seismology statistic. Of course, we can uh, compute B value, F value, magnitude completeness, and the other, and et cetera. Uh, in the in the for B value, F value, and magnitude completeness, we use uh, moment magnitude. Uh, the first we have to homogenize homogenize the magnitude from ml mb m uh, b capital and the other magnitude to mw and the high correlate the high correlating from mlv to mw We can see the B value Indonesia from relocated catalog. We use 
for forty four thousand and two hundred five data. Of course, uh, in the first time we we do the clustering data. Yeah, this is a uh, independent data, independent earthquake. In the value, in the B value, we can see in the in Sumatra, uh, Northern Maluku, uh, Southern Java have low B value. It means uh, those area have high stress, and but Banda have relative high value. It means uh, in Banda, uh, so many really stress. This is a standard deviation of B value in Indonesia. In if we look the standard deviation, it's rel relatively good because it it have uh, it has a small value. This is a F value in Indonesia. Banda so high F value. It means uh, in Banda area have high seismicity. Has high seismicity. Okay. This is the magnitude completeness. Before 2020, this is uh, the before new seismo meter installed. So the magnitude completeness relative more than port magnet more than port magnitude, especially for in not Maluku because. Maybe it's covered by network. Okay. And then what we can do again with the data? We have uh, applied tomography seismic in Banda area with the data. We use 109,000 uh, 9, and 500 to data with 37 station. This is uh, the distribution of epicenter, and this is of the rivet. We use simul PS12, which developed by Turber, Turber or Turber algorithm. This is the sensitivity test in the area. It's so for zero depth and more 200 depth, no sensitivity. It's mean uh, ambient tomography is so important uh, implement, implement in Indonesia because for cellular structure, uh, body web tomography could not resolve. This is the our result. Uh, we can uh, so we can see clearly a slab from from Timor slab from north to south and from uh, sorry from south to north and in the vertical section we can see the p slab structure p slab structure in the seram subduction zone and it's correlate it linear with the before figure and the slab seram there are there are low velocity zone because this is a seismic, a seismic zone. 
in this uh, figure of P. Sep Subduction John from Timor Tanibar Slab to Seram Slab. This is uh, we can see the slab clearly and the magmatic activity in the Banda Sea. This is the seismic tomography in Nusa Tenggara uh, from East Java to Nusa Tenggara Nusa Tenggara Island. Uh, we use even eight thousand and forty two even and forty six station. This is the private and we can see the sensitivity uh, at least we get good sensitivity until 150 kilometer for zero and more than 150 kilometer we, could, we couldn't get the good sensitivity Okay, in the cross section, we can see the slab. The as it gets steeper, because uh, the uh, the edge slab in eastern part more older than western part, so the slab is stiffer we can see in the cross section dd accent uh, we can see the relation between slab to the volcanic arc in the the accent is i think gunung agung vulcano and ff accent is uh, rinjani vulcano we can see the magmatic activity uh, beneath the Gunung Agung Vulcano and Rinjani Vulcano. And we can see uh, sediment sub sediment in the Porak region we with subduct subducted to to the slab. Uh, this is a uh, so Flores back actras region too in this like like I saw in, in Pointer with high anomaly Flores back actras in the northern part uh, from Bali to Nusa Tenggara East Nusa Tenggara. Uh, I think it's uh, this result is good enough for regional structure, uh, but for cell structure, we could use uh, the other method like ambient noise tomography. Okay, uh, this is. Uh, what we can do with this result, uh, this is a uh, one sample. Uh, we can updating slab in the area using the uh, previous result. How it can how how it can be delineated. We can delineate it with a plot, a positive anomaly, and then we can get the slab model. Uh, and then uh, in the last, in the future, in the future, we can do many things 
Advanced Tectonic Studies in Indonesia using relocated BMKG earthquake catalog. Uh, thank you for everyone and terima kasih. Oke, okay, thank you Pak Ramdan for a very nice presentation and also very comprehensive uh, presentation. Oke, okay, is there any question from the participant, please? Yes, um, so uh, Muhammad, you gave a wonderful presentation with many impressive results. And it seems you are making very good use of your data. Um, you already have many results that can be reported, reported in uh, scientific literature. So uh, what is your plan? What's the plan at BMKG to to select to select some pieces some parts of your report for publication in journal okay, okay. thank Please. you pa muni uh, of course uh, uh, our our group want to for the first time want to Publish in the in the one paper about updating data catalog BM, BMKG. Uh, then we have uh, this this job uh, can be reference like uh, Engdal catalog uh, can be refer uh, reference to tectonic study in Indonesia. For many tectonic study like seismic hazard assessment, tomography, or many many things of tectonic study in Indonesia. Paramdan, I think uh, have you published your result? And maybe also, uh, if not yet, uh, which one that um, you have? No, uh, not yet. Uh, Now we we prepare to publish uh, yeah. in the working group. Uh, now uh, I hope uh, Mr. Muni can have us to prepare the uh, at least we. Uh, uh, yeah, I the, think we can prepare for collaboration yeah. to prepare of the publication in the next. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, At from US from USGS group uh, Mr. Sean Hutchings also did some similar yeah. work yeah. so Sean can you uh, maybe comment on one aspect of what you saw if you uh, can comment please hmm uh, well awesome presentation it was really good it was really cool to see um with the bmkg data um i mean yeah i mean it, it's it's cool to see that at least like a lot of the plots i've made um they seem to be consistent with what you guys are getting to so um yeah it's uh, it's really it's really interesting to see do you think sean that uh, they have the potential to solve Uh, a mystery, you know, maybe uh, to mm. to understand better the seismic gap or the plate geometry. What do you think? What problem can be solved that uh, you could not solve? Yeah, definitely. Um, maybe there's a there's a good one. There's that gap that's kind of in the uh, northern Celebes Sea um, that not a lot of people seem to have looked into. Um, that would be Um, that could be resolved. Um, maybe some more work in uh, like uh, West Papua um, because the geometry of this lab is not well known or well constrained around there. Um, yeah, and then the um, just more work into 
um, like understanding why the deep seismicity dies off um, farther west into Sumatra. Um, yeah, so I think I think a lot of mysteries could be could be solved for sure with the with the better data. I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, we could help them by making a list, maybe, of some things to mm -hmm. to look at. Um, in the Banda C cross sections, uh, maybe it was uh, C and D. The slab almost seemed to go horizontal above four ten. Usually, it is. It is uh, going flat at 660, but here, oh yeah, here, here, uh, let's go to um, C. Yeah, it seems like the boundary, the barrier to subduction is uh, the top of the transition zone. Uh, as we know, the mantle transition zone is between 410 and 660. In this case, both of the slabs seem to bend yeah. at the top of the 410, which is maybe the first time this has been shown by anyone. So this, this would be a valuable result for you to publish because it shows uh, a unique feature. Sean, have you seen a 410 bound barrier before? Is this the first time? For me, it's the first time to see this phenomenon. Uh, yeah, like it, well, at least for this profile, like I've seen this um, uh, with a similar cross section. Because um, I know there's the two, there's two different slab models for this area that have been proposed. There's the two slab um, model where it's you know, a separate slab under Saram versus a separate one coming from the Timor side. Um, and then there's the single slab one. So I wonder yeah. if this could be just kind of showing that some formal folding or maybe that 410 boundary contributes to that folding as well, which would be pretty interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, but other than, other than the band C, I haven't seen a 410 um, like that. Yeah. So Pak Muhammad, I think, the problem you have is you have too much data and ah. too few people, too few people, not enough uh, people to understand all of the interesting questions of Indonesian seismology. Of course, uh, I, I will uh, divide the, the region. Uh, it just so yeah, look, yeah. look over all. Uh, uh, you have to divide, divide and yeah. conquer. Yeah. Of course, uh, we have to divide. We have to divide, divide. I think so. So, um, Pak Supri, I think there needs to be a plan and a strategy, like uh, going into battle. You need to have a battle plan. How to to win step by step not to attack not to attack everything at the same time you yeah. will lose your, your 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 force lose your force and power if you try yeah. everything at the same time okay yeah. okay very good thank you thank I think you this enough no no other question yeah i think uh, another speaker uh from usgs uh, jessica reed uh, did look at uh, a lot of the earthquakes and um, tsunami potential. So uh, maybe Jessica, what do you, what did you see that was of most interest to you? I don't I don't know if she's on the call. I didn't see her in the in the participant list. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Hello, any question from participant? Maybe one question from me, Pak Ramdan. Yeah. Actually, after uh, in recently years in 2020, yeah, mm -hmm. after we improving the number of uh, 
deployment of the seismic instrument. Mm -hmm. I think what is the improving the number of recording at quick? Yeah, is of it course. significant? Uh, we are ongoing process, Pak Supri, for data 2020. Uh -huh. So. This is a data 2019, so we are still process. Okay. Still processing. Pak Walter, actually we have a problem with the catalog about the magnitude, the homogeneity of the magnitude. Historical magnitude record by the historical instrument and also historical uh, system processing. Maybe the magnitude six in historical is different with the magnitude six. Uh, maybe in in uh, today. Right. Uh, right. So, what do you comment about that? To we keep the homogeneity of the magnitude. Yes. Um, I know that this is a good question for us to ask uh, Mr. Harley Benz from NEIC, how they address the question of the change in magnitude estimation with time. Um, I prefer let, to let him answer the question, but the, the main idea is not to make any big change because the catalog then will have two period, one period and another. Maybe small change with time is okay, is better. Yeah. I will ask him to okay. discuss this with you. It's a good question. No simple answer. <laughs> okay, I, I think no more question from the participant. Uh, one more question. Okay. What about the focal mechanism with the new catalog? Can you make a better focal mechanism? Uh, actually, in, in BMKG, uh, of course, uh, we, we process focal mechanism for magnitude more than five, yeah? Uh, yeah. Because uh, if less than magnitude five, it's so hard. So I think there are improvement uh, compared with the GMT catalog because uh, we use a local station, yeah. Uh, yeah. Compared with the CMT or Harvard, you which using which using global station seismic. But uh, most people find that the uh, global CMT is very accurate for magnitude greater than six. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, okay. And um, what is your average magnitude of completeness? Uh, Fred, uh, before we start section uh, about for for not but I hope uh, I hope after installation new station uh, we can improve the magnitude of completeness. So so now you think four point four. Yeah, how much the high I think relatively. Yeah, high relative, relative high. Not good enough. Mm -hmm. Not good enough. Yeah, should be uh, maybe four point zero. Yeah, 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 a little bit lower. Okay. 3.5 is 3.5 yeah even yeah, 3. Yeah. Point, I agree I agree even 3.5 yeah okay because the uh, USGS catalog is complete uh, 4.6 Sean what's 4.6 or 4.7 uh, it's 4.6 4.6 yeah oh, global data or the just from the US right Use, using the local data, using the uh, global seismic network data recorded, transmitted back to USGS. Yeah. 
Okay, I, uh, I have one more question, but close. This is also might be the problem of the data quality. If we deploy or install the instrument, uh, we just uh, might be using the GPS or using the compass to determine the uh, direction of orientation of the seismometer. So the question is how we can how to know the uh, miss of the orientation of the seismometer from the data that uh, after we record. If we, for example, if we have the waveform, how can we know that in the waveform if is have the the uh, true or orientation direction of the seismometer, Pak Walter? How to improve? How to improve the seismometer? Yeah. Do not, for example, because it's very important. Yeah, I think that uh, Mr. Dan McNamara one would like to help you with this question: how to to do? Okay, uh, he he's really expert for this question. Okay, thank you very much. I think. Uh, very nice, very hot discussion today. Yeah, very good. Interesting topic today. And maybe uh, we can also continue training in the future with uh, similar or other topic. And yes. we also will continue uh, tomorrow, maybe. Yes, that's right. Um, One think, more day. Yeah. It is enough for today, Pakos. Enough for today. Okay. Thank you. We very feel much. tired in California. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Walter, Joanne, and also all of the participants. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good uh, afternoon. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. 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 Thank Thank you very much for all speaker today, especially for uh, thanks, thanks a big uh, thanks for Walter and join, uh, and uh, yeah, of course support team from MKG. Thanks for all knowledge and insight for us, and I hope everyone in here, especially participant, can be able to understand deeply about this topic because topic uh, at the day is a really good and new for us. <laughs> So I hope you understand uh, uh, what the, what this condition. And I have the quote of the day. Quote of the day. Uh, Henry Ford said, uh, "Anyone who stops learning is old, whether at 20 or 80. But anyone who keeps learning stay young. So stay learn and stay young. Yeah. Good night. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you for the quote. Yeah. 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 Thank you. See you next tomorrow. See you tomorrow. So, uh, Bye, everyone. Joanne, uh, wait, yeah. we'll Bye. talk with Madonna. Madonna, okay. Joanne will give you her PowerPoint. How big are your files, Joanne? Um, Maybe you can convert to uh, to PDF uh, file. Okay. I yeah, think that's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Do you have yeah, Madonna's they're, email? They're quite big. Um, it's in, I think so. She has emailed us the, the Zoom. Uh, you can send to me right. anyway. I need to put, put them in a file anyway, because I have okay, to Okay, I'll send it. To, send them to me and then I'll send I'll it. I'll send her. it to you. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank uh, you. In, P you. in PDF format. Yeah, PDF, yes. Because yes. they're too large to yeah. email. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah, it's possible. That'll be yeah. fine. Yeah, thank you, Walter. See you next Thank you, tomorrow. Madonna. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Yeah. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Let's uh, have a dream. <laughs> So we'll deal with this tomorrow, Joanne. We'll talk about okay. it, about the PDF and all that. I'm going to go to bed. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'll see you tomorrow, Walter. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Ya. Buat Bapak dan Ibu semua, nanti jangan lupa ya, besok kita akan uh, post uh, examination. Dipersiapkan aja.
soalnya sama dengan yang kemarin ya ya dan uh, selamat siang terima kasih banyak atas kehadirannya saya tutup uh,